1997 and 1998, after killing at least one local woman the year before, the Spokane serial killer rampaged through the eastern Washington Inland Empire City, kidnapping and murdering woman after woman, plucking them with increasing frequency from East Sprague Avenue, a popular stretch of road for sex workers less than a mile from both downtown Spokane and the campus of Gonzaga University. Even though nearly all his victims came from the same place, this killer was especially hard to catch because he didn't look like anyone you would think would be a serial killer. He wasn't some loner with a history of sexual or violent crimes, wasn't some blatantly dysfunctional deviant like Arthur Shawcross, wasn't some creepy loner like Richard Ramirez. He was a married, middle-aged father of five, married for over 20 years to the mother of all five of his children. Robert Lee Yates, in addition to being a serial killer, was also a military veteran who served honorably overseas, a former helicopter pilot, and a guy who just seemed to most to be a good, hardworking, all-American family man. In reality, behind closed doors, not always the greatest father. He could be a good dad, actually. He was real good at living two separate lives, but he could also be verbally and physically abusive. He definitely wasn't a great husband. He was controlling and cruel in addition to constantly cheating on his wife. He was a man who seemed addicted to sex workers, but only those sex workers seemed to know that in the years leading to his capture. For years, he regularly snuck away from his large family at night to cruise down Spokane Sprague Avenue just a few miles from home, looking for local sex workers to hire and sometimes to kill. After having sex with his victims, Yates would coldly shoot them in the head, often two or more times, then put a plastic bag over their head to keep excessive blood for getting all over his vehicle. And then after having sex with them again, it seems, he had dumped their bodies out of his car or van like they were just some trash he wanted to get rid of, and then just go back home to the fam. Got to get up early the next day to take the kids fishing. Those women's lives meant nothing to him. Yates killed at least 16 people, 15 women, one man. Most of his victims were killed in Spokane and picked up so close to where I was studying or partying at nearby uh, Gonzaga University when he picked them up. He killed the majority of his victims during my junior year when I was having the time of my life. One of his victims, just 16 years old, younger than me and all the other college kids I was partying with, we were living such very different lives than the women he hunted and preyed on. Doesn't feel fair. Wasn't fair. None of his victims had ever harmed Yates in any way. Right up until he was caught, the general public had no real idea who police were looking for. An FBI profiler said the killer was likely a white male between the ages of 20 and 40 who was probably a loner. White male loner. That did not narrow shit down at all. Spokane has long been one of the whitest cities in America, over 85% white. In Gonzaga, when I went there, super white campus. We joke about how a friend of ours in our little circle always asked to be in campus promotional publications. It seemed like she was the only black girl not on the basketball team who was studying there at the time. Gonzaga and Spokane loaded with young white male loners. Every dorm had at least a dozen. Felt like the killer could be almost anyone. One of your classmates, the cashier at the grocery store, the guy who just walked into the bar. While no one had any idea who the killer was, people were still shocked when he was caught. Whoever you pictured in your head likely did not match up to Yates. A married father of five? A decorated military veteran? Local blue-collar worker well-liked by his colleagues? Respected even? A soft-spoken, about as average-looking as it gets guy with no prior record of crimes against women outside of a misdemeanor assault charge he got for a fight with one of his daughters shortly before he was caught for the murders. This week, we get to know the life and crimes of Spokane serial killer Robert Lee Yates. While I was raising what I thought was some hell at Gonzaga, Robert was truly raising some real hell for woman after woman, sometimes just a few blocks away. Who was Robert Lee Yates? Who were his victims? What do we know about this prolific and recent American serial killer who has been talked about so little compared to his criminal peers? Find out today on another true crime. Let's all cheer when this dirtbag dies someday edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sack. Step on into the cult of curious. I'm Dan Cummins, a suck master, suck nasty, Illuminati confirmed since 2016. And you're listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, glory be to Triple M, and fuck Putin. Continue to be blown away by the bravery and courage of the Ukrainian people and the helpful Polish people as well. And if you somehow think Putin is is a good guy, ridding Ukraine of dangerous neo-Nazis on some kind of noble military mission, Please stop allowing yourself to be manipulated by Russian bots. Get off the internet. Get into some counseling. Your brain is not working very well right now. 
Uh, thanks to all the meat sacks with Great Brains who came out to Atlanta a few weeks ago by the time you hear this. Uh, had fun at the Punchline. Hoping I had fun in Charlotte as well. I bet I did. Atlanta and Charlotte, both very cool cities. Uh, more cool cities coming up on the Symphony of Insanity stand-up tour. You can find dates at dancummins.tv. Tempe, Raleigh, Missoula coming up soon. Some shows sold out. Uh, Salt Lake City, Springfield, Missouri. Chicago, Davenport, Iowa coming up. Um, did I say Milwaukee? Because Milwaukee is coming up as well. Uh, and then a bunch more dates in the fall that I'll be announcing soon. Uh, take lounging to the next level with an awesome new set of Time Suck loungewear in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Throwing it back with the retro pattern featuring the Time Suck atomic symbol on a pair of lounge pants for studying or relaxing. It's your favorite episode. Uh, it's a kimono. Yes, I said kimono, you know, uh, for whatever uses you prefer. Could be lounging, could be for sexy time. Could also be for work I don't uh, I don't know about. Uh, where do you work? Do they allow kimonos? Do they allow sexy time at your work? Is your work sexy time? Hail to Zafina. Head on over to badmagicmerch.com and check it out. Uh, quick congrats to Black Rifle Coffee for going public a while back. A huge step towards their company goal of uh, employing 10,000 veterans. Very cool goal. Uh, we've been guzzling down their coffee for a few years now here in the Suck Dungeon. Logan and I may be addicted. Fridge may be loaded with it. Uh, drank quite a bit last night, staying up late to make sure a lot of today's dates were correct. Damn you questionable sources. Uh, these guys and gals do so much philanthropic work. Uh, they're donating more than 530,000 shares, currently valued at approximately $8.5 million to the BRCC Fund, the company's foundation that supports its mission of bettering the lives of veterans. And they regularly donate six-figure chunks to charity. First responders, veterans primarily, it's, uh, it's very inspiring. So cheer to them for being good folks who actually do good work Instead of just talking about it or instead of, uh, you know, bitching about other people doing good work on the internet. So that's uh, pretty respectable, I think. Uh, speaking of charity, I, I keep forgetting to promote uh, the Bad Magic Charity of the Month this month. So sorry to uh, NOCF, New Orleans Community Fridges. That is who we donated to this month, Ukraine next month. Uh, New Orleans Community Fridges, a collective effort focused on creating resources that empower our communities and support voices that are marginalized and helping to remove stigma around food scarcity. Uh, we donated 13900 to this great charity. Thanks for our Patreon supporters. You can visit nolacommunityfridges.org for mo more info. And we donated 1500 to our new scholarship fund, which we're building throughout this year. And then we'll actually start helping students a bit uh, next year. Got to do more to try and make this world of ours a little more educated. Less conspiracies, <laughs> more education. Uh, the best way to make this planet better for all of us to live on. And, and, and I'm done with positive announcements now. No more positivity. Now we're going to venture to darkness and, and we'll, we'll get into positivity again in the, in the updates, but now darkness uh, into another, thank God, this story is not about me tale. Time to dig into the story of Robert Lee Yates, the man given the, the super clever nickname of the Spokane serial killer by the local uh, Spok uh, Spokane press. Man, spokesman reviewed journalist uh, creatively killing it back in the 90s. Are we talking about Robert Berdella, the collector, the Kansas City butcher this week? No. Are we talking about Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee monster, or the killer clown, John Wayne Gacy, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, David Berkowitz, a.k.a. the Son of Sam, Lonnie Franklin, a.k.a. the Grim Sleeper? No, we're talking about the Spokane serial killer. Who came up with that name? A journalist or some mid-level bureaucrat? Uh, sounds like the same person who came up with names like the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Spokane serial killer. Don't want to offend anyone with a scary descriptive term. Uh, the still living piece of shit may not have a creative or scary nickname, but he, uh, real scary dude. He's a real scary dude. Convicted of killing more fellow meat sacks than many of the other dirt bags we've already covered. But let's begin. The Spokane serial killer Robert Lee Yates preyed primarily on Spokane area sex workers for roughly three years. Uh, he killed his first victims over 20 years earlier. Uh, before killing anyone in Spokane. Overall, his killing spree spanned over 23 years. Longer than the lives of some of the people he killed. Isn't that fucking crazy? One of the victims he killed towards the end wasn't even born yet when he started killing. When Robert was caught, the public, myself included, were shocked. Uh, like I mentioned in the opening of today's show, uh, you know, he just wasn't who anyone expected uh, you know, looks wise, uh, lifestyle wise. Yeah. He didn't look like a monster. He, he looked like a guy who uh, coaches high school softball or who tells you annoying dad jokes at parties. He looked more like, in, in my opinion, a fucking dork than a fearsome killer. He was 47, about to turn 48 when he was caught, balding up top, rocking a kind of pseudo comb over, 
Uh, clean shaven, no hide or weight info is given in any source I can find, but looking at a lot of old family and court photos, I'd put him between 5'10 and 6'1. And when he was the most active as a serial killer, somewhere around 180, 190, maybe 200 pounds. Moderately athletic build, a little bigger than average, but not a big guy. Shoulders, you know, don't seem especially broad. Kind of well-built, but not overly muscular. To me, he looked like a guy who did some push-ups and crunches, didn't eat too much pasta, also not hitting the weight room, uh, not putting up two or three plates aside on the squat rack or the bench press. When he was out in the world, uh, you know, killing, he did not look intimidating, at least not to me. Not like some other killers we've covered. Richard Ramirez, that motherfucker had a scary presence. He wasn't a big guy, but God, he, he terrified me just looking at him. He wanted to look scary. He wanted the people he killed to fear him. And also the people living down the hall at the Cecil Hotel where he was living. You know, John Wayne Gacy, pretty big guy, uh, who looked very creepy, in my opinion. Would have weirded me out if he was my neighbor. Killer or not, uh, Ed Mother Kemper, uh, scary in the sense he was a big fucking guy. Arthur Shawcross, uh, he didn't look right because he was definitely not right. He weirded out pretty much everyone. Uh, But Yates, he just looked like, uh, you know, one of thousands of other Spokane area dads. Wore glasses, didn't dress like a slob, but certainly certainly didn't dress fashionably, right? Tucked a boring dad shirt into some some boring dad jeans. Maybe picked him up at Sears. Maybe picked him up at JCPenney. Looks like he uh, probably got his shoes at Payless. Looked like he never turned his radio on to any station other than uh, classic rock. If if he's feeling like, you know, uh, really, really useful. When he watched a sitcom, it probably needed a laugh track or he wouldn't know where to laugh. And his face, if you didn't know, uh, you know, what he did, I don't think you'd read it as evil. I certainly don't. I'd be more inclined to think he was just uh, boring. Someone I'd pretend to need to, you know, take a phone call just to get out of uh, talking to him than some merciless killer. Comparing him to previous suck subjects, he reminds me of an overall vibe and non-killing aspect of how he lived his life of Dennis Rader, the BTK killer from Wichita, Kansas. Also reminds me in some ways of Lonnie Franklin, South Central Los Angeles is a grim sleeper. He looks kind of like Dennis Rader. They could be cousins. Uh, two branches of the same super fucked up family tree. Both were in the military. Rader uh, also married to the same woman the whole time he killed, whom he had kids with, too. Uh, Rader, like Yates, seemed to be, to most outsiders, good dad, good husband. Uh, also, like Yates, he was harboring some real dark urges. And after acting on them, you know, he could slip right back into family life. Uh, Raiders, uh, you know, he killed uh, his kill span, you know, sp- or God, my God, Raiders kill span. There we go. 27 years, very similar to Yates, four years longer than Yates. Uh, Lonnie Franklin, the Grim Sleeper, also in the military. Uh, his known murder spanned 23 years, just like Yates. Again, both married, you know, they're married to the same woman. I mean, each married to different women at the same time. Yeah. Same woman for them. I'd be weird if they were actually married to the same woman. Uh, Lonnie and his wife, Sylvia, had two kids together. Lonnie had more legal trouble than Yates, but a lot of people in the neighborhood did think he was a good dude, and he was blue-collar like Yates. Lonnie, an auto mechanic, you know, Yates towards the end, a heavy equipment operator, machinist, kind of a factory worker of sorts. Uh, Like Yates, if you just saw Lonnie or Dennis on the street, I I don't think you'd be afraid of him or even think twice about him. He looked average, didn't stand out. And I think that quality of not being that noticeable helped him a lot when it came to how long they were able to keep killing and not get caught. Yates specifically, he really uh, hid behind the mask of being a family man, the phrase he would use to describe himself many times. He lived in the suburbs, Spokane South Hill, uh, but not the like the ritziest, well-to-do, cool part, not too far from the hospitals. Uh, He lived at uh, 2220 East 49th Avenue. Pretty average, nondescript house. Four bedrooms, two baths, about 2,000 square feet with an attached garage, uh, for local Spokane area listeners, uh, he lived about a thousand feet behind that big ass target off of South Regal. Lived less than a mile from Ferris High School in a very average middle class neighborhood at that time. When he was finally caught, I was actually working at a 24 hour fitness that's no longer there that was less than half a mile from his house. Could have easily passed that guy heading to work. I sometimes grab lunch from that same Albertson's grocery store he probably shopped at, you know, uh, on 57th Avenue. Dude lived with a wife and five kids. Five! Have we covered a serial killer with that many kids before? Yes, once, I believe. Richard Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman, back in episode 51. But he was a mafia hitman, paid assassin, not a guy killing random sex workers because that got him off. 
And he had two kids with his first wife, three with his second, not the same devoted, super stable uh, family guy image. Psychos and deviant nymphomaniacs, Fred and Rose West, they did actually uh, have five kids together, but they also killed one of their kids and raped their kids. Uh, They did not present a wholesome family image to anyone. I don't know of any other killer whose family didn't know they were a killer who had five or more kids with the same woman uh, he was married to for over 20 years. Like that level of kind of like supposedly wholesome stability on one side, counteracting the killing on the other side. Uh, Yates, you know, clearly exceptionally uh, good at compartmentalization at leading two very different lives. When he wasn't killing, he was a, just a regular old stereotypical middle-class breadwinner. He worked in a light manufacturing center while doing most of his killing. Uh, Pan Troll. Uh, it's, it's still still around in the Spokane Valley. Uh, well, actually, it's not in the Spokane Valley. It's in, in Spokane proper, not that far from Gonzaga. Off of, uh, not too far from Trent. But anyway, nine to five job working in industrial automation. Not as a designer, as a machinist, a guy who uh, could run some of the machines that made whatever the hell they were making at the time. Very technical. Spokane has a lot of machinists. It's largely a blue collar city. It was more so, I think, in the 90s. And Yates blended in perfectly. He was in the army almost 20 years, full time. Uh, then he was in the National Guard. Seemed like such an all American dude. Seemed like he could be just about anybody's brother, father, son, friend, or coworker in the area. And that's what made him so damn scary. Robert was really good at blending in with the Spokane crowd. Looked like a guy who probably liked to fish and hike and hunt. A guy who cheered for the Seahawks, loved the Zags. Well, no one loved the Zags in the mid nineties. They were, they were fucking terrible, but he looked like a guy who would cheer for the Zags now and congrats to the Zags, by the way, uh, heading into the sweet 16 again, as I record this, uh, if I would have seen him walking around, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, on some paved trail, maybe in Riverfront park or maybe grabbing some brew cheese in the Northtown mall food court, still love me a brew cheese cheesesteak. I would have thought nothing of it. Would have never given him a second look. What also helped Yates kill for so long was that his first two targets, totally random, he had no idea who they were. They were just people in the wrong part of the woods at the wrong time. If he would have stopped killing after those first two victims, I don't think he would have ever ended up on a suspect list. And then the rest of his victims, sex workers, he preyed on a marginalized group of people like so many serial killers, you know, because it's easier to get away with. Uh, as we've learned over and over, uh, you know, sex workers just disappear and their whereabouts are tracked more poorly than just about any other group of people in America. It can take law enforcement a long time to establish a pattern in their disappearances. Or and or deaths that could lead to the assessment that a serial killer is responsible and that a task force needs to be put together. Then when a pattern between how victims are dying can, you know, combined with DNA on their bodies is discovered, uh, still took a while to find out who was responsible for these crimes because the suspect list, you know, was gigantic. Who were police looking for? A white dude who frequented sex workers in Spokane's red light district of sorts, uh, East Sprague Avenue. That only cut down the suspect list to hundreds, if not thousands of dudes. And new guys were adding themselves to the suspect list every day. Even when a local task force was formed to catch the Spokane serial killer and had mounds of evidence, they had a hard time matching the evidence to anyone. Officers spoke to other girls in the area, pimps, drug dealers, and boyfriends, and there wasn't a lot to go on. A few clues did emerge, and those uh, uh, you know um, do not appear have been to f- do not appear to have been followed up on very effectively. But was that bad police work, or did those clues just get lost in a, a sea? of God knows how many other leads and tips also coming in, uh, you know, that wouldn't turn out to be useful. I feel like that gets overlooked a lot with investigations. Not saying fuck-ups, you know, uh, don't happen, that they weren't made here. Just saying investigations, in my opinion, uh, rarely get portrayed fairly. Uh, detectives were stumped, and working girls on Sprague Avenue were terrified. They didn't know who the killer was, and many of them stuck to their trusted regulars, their safe dates, Uh, thinking that that would make them, you know, uh, less likely to be killed, not knowing that one of those safe dates was the killer. A former sex worker identified only as Kathy spoke to author Burl Bearer for his novel on Yates called Body Count, a novel we relied on uh, for a lot of the information today. And she said to Yates, he learned plenty just sitting with us at the Coach House coffee shop. Ah, the Coach House. I don't know if that's there anymore. Uh, All us hookers would sit around talking about who and what we did, and he would just be real quiet, pleasant, passive, and if one of us needed to ride somewhere, he would give us a lift. We didn't know him as Robert Lee Yates Jr., of course. Sometimes he was Dan. Sometimes he was Bob. Dan. Where's my dad when this was going on? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, The girls liked Yates because he gave them easy dates. He was described as being generous and passionate. He wasn't kinky. He paid up front. And sometimes, and I find this incredibly odd for this man who returned home to his wife and five kids after uh, killing, he smoked a little bit of crack with many of these women. Just a little bit of crack. 
right? He probably, he probably didn't even really inhale. Yeah, he has to be a good dude. Bob and I just smoked some crack together a few weeks back. All right, let's see what we can learn about this murderous maniac. He, he was a lot more tight-lipped than most serial killers after being caught. Doesn't like to brag about how evil he is like Shawcross used to do. But we still found enough about this piece of shit to tell an interesting tale. Time to discuss Robert Yates' life from his birth up until now. Learn who his victims were. Learn about his life as both a family man and as a killer in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On May 27th, 1952, Robert Lee Yates, born in Oak Harbor, Washington. Oak Harbor described as a Puget Sound community where the quiet calm is often punctuated by the rumbling of jet engines from strike aircraft and patrol planes in the flight pattern at nearby Whidbey Island Naval Air Station. Uh, it's located on, of course, Whidbey Island, uh, in Island County, Washington. 2019, the estimated population, 23,565. Back in the 1950s, the population was less than 2,000. Oak Harbor was incorporated May 14, 1915. Remains the largest incorporated city on the island, named after the Gary Oak Trees on the skyline. Very cute town on a very picturesque island. Just a couple years after Yates would be arrested and put away for life, in 2002 and 2003, I took several trips to Whidbey Island, which is just a little over an hour from Seattle with no traffic, a drive up I-5, then a short ferry ride to the south side of the island. I'd go stay with the great Seattle comic and great dude named David Cross. I'm sorry, Dave, not David Cross. <laughs> sorry, David. Uh, David Crow. Uh, my, my mind uh, went to another comic. It was uh, a very funny comic. But anyway, uh, David Crow used to live on the south side. Uh, Dave doesn't really work the circuit anymore, which is a shame. Very funny. But uh, back then he did. And he was the first guy to take me out on the road, take me out in, into clubs to open up for him. Learned a lot. We were in a little two-man comedy show called Cobb Dog for a little while. Uh, Crow on bass, Dan on guitar. Did some songs, did some sketches. Uh, one of the sketches made an old uh, Best of Bob and Tom album during that radio station's heyday. I've lived a lot of different comedy lives. And I, and I thought Dave lived in such a cool place. I mean, he did. So green, so much awesome Pacific coastline and the Puget Sound, so peaceful. Not that you could pick where it would make sense for a serial killer to be born, but, but if you uh, were to pick, I just don't think anyone would pick anywhere on Whidbey Island. Oak Harbor's population grew because of the completion of the Deception Pass Bridge on July 31st, 1935 that connected the north side of the island to mainland Washington. And then the completion of the Naval Air Station on Whidbey Island, September 21st, 1942, led to more jobs, more residents. Whidbey has a pleasant Mediterranean climate with dry summers and chilly but rarely freezing winters. Oak Harbor, considered a safe community full of families today, would probably probably even safer when, when old Bobbert grew up there. Sleepy little island town where backpacking, hunting, dirt bike riding, fishing, other wholesome activities uh, were the rule, not the exception. Bobbert's parents were Anna May and Robert Lee Yates Sr. Yes, he's a junior. He was, and would remain, he was and would remain the only child of the couple. Yates' family were normal middle-class Americans, uh, described as warm, caring, generous people. The family attended a local Seventh-day Adventist church in Oak Harbor, small congregation of less than 100 believers. I've researched a few Seventh-day Adventists before, and more so than a lot of other Protestant de denominations, uh, real strong emphasis on clean living. Right? Healthy living. Eat, eat well. Take care. Body's a temple. Stay away from the crack, Bobby. Stay away from soda even and candy. But for sure, stay away from crack. Oh, it's hard to hit that crack high note, even if you don't inhale. Not that crack existed back then. All of Robert's family and uh, friends uh, would call him Bobby to differentiate him from his father. Bobby was a quiet and good-mannered child. Never stood out too much from any of the other kids. He loved dad and baseball the most. America! Fuck yeah, bro. Uh, his dad coached a little league team where he was described as being a solid, never the best player. He became a pitcher in high school for the Oak Harbor Wildcats and a good one. He could throw a fastball with precision, recalled former teammate Harry Ferrier. Yates had a 7-1 record his junior year in high school. Uh, according to former classmates, Yates was neither too outgoing nor exceptionally shy, uh, neither a hedonistic animal nor a celibate hermit. He wasn't a wild ladies man, but he did date. He was kind of quiet, said Ferrier, who lived in nearby Anacortes at the time of his interview, shortly after Yates was arrested and charged with multiple murders in Spokane. Ferrier added, he was kind of like Joe Average. For money, young Bobbert mowed lawns, worked at gas stations, uh, harvested peas with another former childhood friend, Gary Burner. <laughs> oh, Gary Bear! Uh, in the summer, making $1.80 an hour. 
The worst thing I knew about Bob is he wouldn't play football his senior year, said Berner, also interviewed shortly after Yates' arrest. Bobbert had a steady, unnamed and sources girlfriend at the end of high school who moved away from Oak Harbor during their senior year, and that's when he thought, fuck everyone! Now I have to kill some people! Don't get to live near my girlfriend for a few months! No, actually, he didn't seem especially bothered by the move. Uh, With no date for the homecoming dance, he spent the evening playing uh, Canasta, a card game kind of like Rummy, with his buddy Al Gotti at the Yates family home. He was very much loved, said Gotti, of his old pal, Bobby Yates. He said there was a lot of respect in that family. They were the type of people that you'd want as your neighbor. Mr. Yates, he'd give you the shirt off his back. Yates and Gotti, two youths contemplating their futures, considered careers as biologists or game wardens. Gotti joined the army. Yates went to Skagit Valley Community uh, College in nearby Mount Vernon. I think I added a community there. It's just Skagit Valley College. I think it is a community college. Uh, Nearby Mount Vernon from 1970 through the spring of 1972, earning an associate art degree in general studies. Mount Vernon, barely over a half hour drive from Oak Harbor. Back in 1970, less than 9,000 people lived there. Gaddy and Yates would remain friends up until Yates went to prison. Uh, You know, and Gaddy said that Bobby was uh, always respectful and courteous, that even when he went to college, he didn't yield to pop culture trends or in-crowd behavior, while other youths grew their hair long. During the counterculture movement, Yates kept his closely clipped. While their kids were out there smoking that devil's lettuce pot, dropping acid, practicing free sinful love, Yates didn't do any of that nonsense. Gaddy said he didn't smoke and he didn't drink. Nothing or anything like that. So much exciting shit's happening all around him. Uh, truly the height of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Kids his age, you know, they're rocking out to the Grateful Dead, stoned out of their minds, casually fucking in Volkswagen vans. Going to concerts during arguably the best time ever for live music in American history. But not Junior. Mm -mm, He's still a Seventh-day Adventist who actually seemed to follow a lot of their repressive teachings. Very little fun allowed. So many people seem to believe that God hates fun. Go be sad. Go be sad and pray. God wants you to hate the world that God made. Uh, I wonder if Bob would have just fucking cut loose a little more when he was younger. Would that have helped him not create such a dark, sexual-based secret life later? Would that have helped him, uh, you know, maybe not smoke crack with sex workers behind his wife's back? Would it have uh, helped him not prey on women he paid for sex and sometimes also killed? His buddy Al, also a a goody two-shoes growing up, he said of he and Yates, we didn't give in to peer pressure. That wasn't our thing. Not our thing, dude. Uh, Our thing was hunting and fishing and hiking. Uh, Good for you two fucking dorks. Uh, One popular hiking excursion for Yates uh, and Gotti while Yates was studying at Mount Vernon was a 16-hour round trip backpacking outing. In Washington's Cascade Mountains, they wanted to fish the isolated lake for its famed 20-inch trout. Yates will remain an avid outdoorsman, boasting to Gaddy many years later that his third daughter and he stalked deer together, a cause for celebration, because none of his other daughters were attracted to the sport. According to Gaddy, Yates told him, we had a terrific time. Bob Yates was very Pacific Northwest. Picture him, you know, splurges on some Teva sandals from time to time, maybe getting a nice Columbia jacket. Uh, It seems like if Bobby was into anything deviant or abnormal growing up, leading any kind of secret life, either no one knew about it or no one has come forward to talk about it. Would be weird for Gaddy to mention something evil after hiding all those years if it did happen, though. Right? If he was like, "Uh, did Bobby ever kill sex workers? (laughs) Oh, heck yeah. No, we, oh yeah, we both did. (laughs) He was just dumb enough to get caught later. I know how to keep my mouth. Oh no. Oh shoot. Are you going to write this in your paper? Oh, dang it. My wife's going to be so pissed. Uh, Bobby did possibly keep at least one secret from his family and friends growing up. He will claim that when he's six years old, an older neighbor kid, an 11 year old, molested him to a degree he never uh, specified, never elaborated on. Uh, Bobby never told anyone about this uh, until decades later after his arrest. And I, and I got to think, unlikely that this kid raped him. I mean, the, the kid was just 11. Was it intentional molestation or was it little boys being weird? Right? I just say that because 11 is very young. My friends and I used to hit each other in the nuts when we were that age and give each other wedgies, uh, slap each other's butts. You could technically classify all that horseplay as, you know, sexual assaults if you really wanted to. I don't know. Maybe he was molested. Maybe I just have a hard time feeling any sympathy for Yates after knowing everything he's done. Uh, There was also one interesting family secret before Bobby's time that his friends didn't seem to know about. This is pretty weird. 1945, his grandmother uh, murdered his grandfather brutally. I feel like that's not very common. Uh, she raised 11 children by herself where her husband spent most of his time working. Then she found out that he had been visiting a local brothel. And when she learned 
uh, you know, that he, that he once took some of the kids there with him. She fucking snapped, took an ax to that guy, struck him on the head four times. And then he survived for four days before he died. God damn. But he had a wicked headache, right? Those last four days of his life. Hey, uh, uh, can, I get a, can I get a little more aspirin? A l- little more. A l- little more again. All of it. Ooh, Bobby's dad, Robert Sr., was in the house when that happened. Ran downstairs, found his dad bleeding on the floor. His mom sitting in a chair afterwards as if nothing had happened. And Yates Sr. said, I was there. I heard the murder in the night. She had given birth to 11 children, but under the stress of having a husband working away from home, and she simply broke. She spent seven years in a state mental hospital. So, obviously, that is pretty crazy to have your grandma ax your grandpa to death. But it also happened seven years before Bobby was born. How much did that really affect him? Seems like it would have been more likely to uh, make his dad a murderer than him. Does it reveal some murderous genetic trait that might have uh, been passed on to him? I don't know, maybe. I think it might have uh, haunted him if he had been, you know, around and old enough to understand what was happening when it happened. But since he never knew his grandpa or his grandma, maybe just a murderous coincidence. Back to back to Skagit Valley Community College now. Uh, while studying there, straight-laced, who knows what kinds of secrets he was hiding. Bobbert uh, worked as a hospital janitor and as a theater usher. Probably never even killed anyone. Did meet a girl named Shirley Nylander from little less than a thousand people at the time, western Washington town of Fall City. Uh, we don't know much about uh, Shirley other than she was a Seventh-day Adventist too. They got married in 1972. And after Bobby graduated with that AA in general studies in October, uh, they moved to College Place, Washington a suburb of Walla Walla in the southeast corner of the state. Bobbert enrolls in Walla Walla College, now Walla Walla University, a Seventh-day Adventist liberal arts college. The Walla Walla Wolves, baby! Founded in 1892. (laughs) Not very far from us, and I've never fucking heard of it. A student body of only around 1,600 undergraduates. That is small. Sounds like a great place to go uh, if you want to get a college degree, but you don't want to risk having any kind of fun. While getting it. No thank you, fun. (laughs) Not for me. Do you like to study but hate parties? Do you like to surround yourself with others in their late teens and early 20s but not feel pressured to ever touch or see any unmarried devil dicks or prince of darkness pusses? Then come to Walla Walla where the library is always open and the party is always closed. Uh, What a good, sweet, stay away from these hedonist hippies boy Bobby was. About 5,000 people lived in College Place when Bobby and his young wife moved there with another roughly 25,000 in neighboring Walla Walla. Walla Walla is very cute. Uh, Junior majors in pre-med. Then for reasons never disclosed in March of 1974, after only about 18 months of marriage, surely she's out. She moves out, goes to live with her folks, asks for a divorce. Bobbert remains in College Place near campus. Why'd she leave? I don't know. Maybe she saw the real Bobbert. Maybe she caught him doing something super creepy, peeping on other girls, talking about sexy dead bodies or something. Still, uh, uh, you know, uh, or sorry, she, if still alive, had to have felt pretty damn good for getting out years later when he's outed as a serial killer. Cannot imagine. Uh, shortly before or after Shirley moved out, Bobbert meets future wife Linda Brewer, a fellow Walla Walla college student, another Adventist, and we know almost nothing about her life pre-Bobby. Doesn't seem like any real serious investigative journalism uh, has been uh, done to dig into her past, and she, for obvious reasons, has not revealed much info. So maybe people tried and no one would talk. Uh, they apply for a marriage license in Walla Walla County just a few months later. Things are moving fast uh, in June. Yes, they want to fuck, but they don't want to anger the Lord. Uh, God only wants married dicks to touch married pusses. Never forget that, Meat Sack. It's very important. The master of the universe is adamant that his people get the proper paperwork filed with the state before any fucking. Uh, in July 1974, Bobby and Linda get married or try to. His divorce uh, not finalized, so the marriage ends up getting annulled. In August, the divorce between Bobby and Shirley is finalized. Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, boy. What have they done? Was the sex they were having around this time sinful? Hard to say, since they did try to get married. Maybe even thought they were married. But they weren't married. God, I'm sure, is going to address all this with both of them once they're dead. Be part of some uh, Heavenly Gates vetting process. Bobbert! Yes, Lord! It is your time to be judged for all your sins, and you have many. I know, I know, Lord. I was a wicked sinner. I I beg for your forgiveness for killing all those women. Yes, all those women and a dude. Uh, We will get to those murders soon. But first, I need to ask you some questions about the beginning of your second marriage. 
technically, you did have premarital sex, but you didn't think you were married for at least some of that. And, uh, oh, this is a tricky one. December 1974, Linda gives birth to their uh, first child, her first daughter, Sonia Yates. Oh, December. They were having sex before that first marriage. Even the annulled one. <laughs> oh, wow. Just made it real easy for God. Definitely sin. Disgusting. Uh, Yates and Linda will have, as I've said, five children, ranging in age from 11 to 25 at the time of his arrest. Uh, his four daughters will be named Sonia, Sasha, Amber, and Michelle. Going to leave his son's name out of this. Uh, his daughters have all spoken publicly about their dad following his arrest. But his son, only again 11 at the time of the arrest, has taken great efforts to not have his life made public in any way. So uh, I will honor that. Early 1975, Yates is hired by the Washington State Department of Corrections to work as a prison guard at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. That's a fun city to say. Walla Walla! Uh, He seems to have gotten this job thanks to Linda's father, fellow uh, Department of Corrections employee. And he is currently serving his life sentence at that exact same prison. Ain't that a bitch. But he never thought he'd be, uh, or bet he'd never thought he'd be on the other side of the bars, right? One of the prison's most notorious inmates, nonetheless, when he was a guard there. At least not when he first started working there. Maybe he wondered about it while he was working there after he uh, had killed two people. On July 13th, 1975, 21-year-old Patrick Oliver and 22-year-old Susan Savage are murdered just outside of Walla Walla. This is incredibly sad. They were childhood best friends. Susan had already earned an associate's degree from Walla Walla Community College, then a Bachelor of Arts in Interior Design from Washington State University, just a few hours away in Pullman. She'd also studied abroad in Guadalajara, Mexico. At the time of her death, she had just gotten a graphic design job, right? Her first like cool, you know, postgraduate job. Patrick still studying at Wazoo, uh, recently completed a study abroad term in Paris. Such promising lives seemed to be ahead of uh, them both. Young, educated, just introduced to the world outside the U.S., Possibly at the beginning of an amazing storybook romance, right? Childhood best friends become adult lovers, perhaps. And then Bobby Fuckhead Jr. uh, steals their future from both of them. All because they happen to be taking a picnic in the same woods at the same time as a creep who had just decided to become a killer. So random. Why why couldn't Bobby's dad have gone crazy and taken an axe to him when he was growing up? Uh, These two were last seen July 13th, 2.15 p.m., Patrick picked up Susan at her parents' house in his Mercury Cougar, drove them to nearby Mill Creek for a picnic. They both told their parents they'd be home by dinner. When neither showed up, no one was too concerned at first. You know, they're both adults. But when day began to turn to night, their parents grew worried. When night turned to morning, everyone's real worried. Patrick and Susan's parents, uh, you know, they both call the police, local hospitals to check for missing persons. Because Patrick and Susan hadn't told anyone exactly where they were going, the police had no idea, unfortunately, where to start searching. Not that it would have helped. Uh, But then Patrick's aunt, Nadine Gerke, had an idea. Since Patrick and Susan hadn't seen each other in a long time, she figured they might want to go to one of their old stomping grounds, one of their old old hangouts. A place about six miles east of Walla Walla near Wickersham Bridge. Patrick's dad, Dan Oliver, his friend Frank Munns, uh, drive up uh, Kuskuski Road to Mill Creek, where Dan finds his son's car parked on the road near Mill Creek. The family then follows the creek, and about a half mile from Wickersham Bridge, they see a pile of debris. They looked at a place with the brush in the area, the debris covered with a tarp, an old tire thrown on top of the pile. Then they see a human foot sticking out from under the tarp. Sweet Jesus. What a fucking insanely tragic turn of events for the families of these two young adults. This poor father... Dan immediately races to the police station. He and Munns make sure not to touch anything at the crime scene. Don't want to contaminate it. Sheriff's deputies arrive, remove the tire, sleeping bag, uh, and debris. Underneath it all lay the dead bodies of Patrick, Oliver, and Susan Savage. Susan was naked from the waist up. Her shirt had been pulled up, revealing her breasts. She was placed on top of Patrick, who was fully clothed. Both had been shot. Susan below her left ear. Patrick threw the arm and shoulder, then his heart. The coroner believed that Patrick raised his arms to defend himself. Man. I'm guessing Susan was shot first and, you know, hit in the head. Might have died before her head even hit the ground. Patrick, you know, sees, hears her get shot, tries to defend himself from a shooter he may not have even seen, dies in a moment of sheer fucking panic, terror, and confusion. Also, Yates could live out some deranged sexual fantasy. It doesn't seem anyone knew he had. Uh, The injuries indicated the killer was a skilled shooter. Susan had a trace of a substance on her body, but funeral home employees washed it away before the police could collect a sample, guessing it was semen. That's what I would guess based on the definite sexual nature of his later murders. The police find trace fingerprints at the crime scene, but no matches come up when they compare the prints to a, you know, prints in a criminal database. Susan and Patrick shot by 357 caliber bullets. 
Uh, the police couldn't find any suspects with the corresponding gun. No one had any idea who would have wanted to kill Patrick and Susan. Truly randomly chosen targets of violence like this. Got to be the hardest crimes to solve. Detectives have no magic ball you know, to look into to figure this stuff out. The Walla Walla Union Bulletin publishes a story, encourages the public to come forward. Uh, many witnesses come forward with tips. Um, most of them not helpful at all. And then, you know, the one that really was helpful maybe got lost in a sea of the other tips. Uh, the important, most important witness was Diane Lackey. Diane agreed to an interview with a psychiatrist uh, to make sure she wasn't bullshitting. Uh, she was also in the area of the murders on the afternoon of July 13th. After an argument with her boyfriend, she stormed off into a ravine near where the bodies were found and was immediately attacked by some shrub sluts. Gosh dang, these were male shrub sluts offering her their, their throbbing woodland erections the second they smelled relationship trouble between her and her boyfriend. God, they're always, they're always there, just ready to wreck a home. Goddamn shrub sluts. Uh, JK, uh, call back to way back in the catalog if you're very confused right now. No, while in the ravine, Diane hears multiple gunshots. Then comes across a man in a clearing in the woods. Uh, he looked to be in his late teens, early 20s, crouching in the undergrowth, uh, watching something. Medium height, slender, medium brown hair, uh, no shirt on. Diane described him as, quote, weird looking. Uh, they stared at each other, then ran off in opposite directions. She thought the man drove a small red car. Uh, which she had seen parked on the road when she arrived, and she believed she had seen the man in town, uh, and she believed she had seen the man in town and would recognize him if she saw him again. A uh, Yates drove a red Dodge Dart at the time. Sure seems like he, she came across Yates not long after he shot Susan and Patrick. He must have ran back to hide their bodies, you know. Fin- uh, I don't know, played himself after she ran off. Or how fucking weird if this guy wasn't Yates. That in addition to a budding serial killer in the woods around Walla Walla that afternoon, there was also just some random topless perv literally hiding in the bushes, shooting at shit. Uh, sadly, this tip did not lead to Yates as a suspect. A solid Seventh-day Adventist with no criminal record, the college student, it couldn't be him. A citizens group put together a $5,000 reward for info. The police interviewed 40 people, collected a large case file, put thousands of hours of work into the case, but came up with no leads. Rumors floated around, uh, Jealousy, uh, a sexually frustrated killer. I, I think that that fits actually. Uh, Patrick's alleged involvement in an underground European drug ring. A false rumor based only on the fact that he had studied abroad. Oh, small town rumor mills. Gotta love them. Boredom plus imagination plus little understanding of the outside world can lead to a lot of interesting speculation. Uh, to be fair though, so weird that they were just randomly shot by some guy who didn't know them who just decided to kill someone. That kind of randomness is going to lead to some strange theories. Instead of investigating everyone, he drove a small red car and owned a 357 handgun. Seems kind of like a huge fuck up in hindsight, but there was, uh, you know, no digital databases for quick comparison back then. Uh, The police assumed jealousy was the motive. They looked into the couple's personal lives. When that didn't pan out, police looked into Patrick being involved in some kind of international crime scheme. (laughs) FBI even worked with Interpol, uh, learned that Patrick stayed at a known drug distribution hotel before he came home. But that was it. And that theory, of course, went nowhere. He just Happened to stay there. I'm sure it was cheap. 1975, in addition to owning a red Dodge Dart, Yates had a Ruger 357. And according to Linda, interviewed many years later, right? His uh, his wife, when he was caught, his favorite place for target practice was near Mill Creek and the Wickersham Bridge. Damn it. Yates never questioned the case. And it would take 25 years for Patrick and Susan's killer to be caught. Following July 1976, Bobbert, the murdering corrections officer, and his wife, Linda, now have a legitimate wedding ceremony with Linda's parents as witnesses. And then... A month later, Linda finds out that old Bobbert has, uh, as a young man often is wont to do, he's drilled a hole in the attic wall that allows him to see into their neighbor's bedroom so he can watch him have sex. Hey, Lucifina, come on. No, JK, that's terrible. Uh, Linda, not sure what the, not sure what her problem was, was so disgusted that she left him. But then she came back a month later, finally agreeing that what he had done was no big deal. What is big deal? So I jerk an attic a little bit. I bother no one. Now she agrees to watch her neighbors fuck with her husband, right? For the following several months, they would whip up some Jiffy Pop together, grab some root beers, maybe some red vine licorice, head up to the attic, watch a show. Huh? What was the big deal? If the action was hot and heavy, Bobbert would, of course, masturbate, and Linda, like a good wife, is supposed to do, now understanding this is all very normal, she would clap and cheer for him, right? Go, Bobby, go! Go, Bobby, go! Come, 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 come. (laughs) <laughs> While being uh, cheered on, Junior would then try to shoot his semen through the people he drilled. And in some kind of like parody of a carnival game, he would try to shoot it down into his neighbor's vagina. 
That's how you win. And, right? And, they, and then they both thought it would just be so funny if she got pregnant and then had a kid who looked so much like Bobby. And then they would tell their neighbors, what a funny game they just played. All in good fun. And of course, that's insane and not true. Uh, no, I'm guessing Bobbert cried, begged Linda to come home, swore he was done with his pervy ways. She relented, uh, right? She didn't want to have to raise a child uh, of divorce or some shit. She will regret not staying away and, and leaving him years later. The following year, it did seem like Bobby was getting his shit together. At some point in 1977, uh, exact date not listed in any sources, the couple's second daughter, Sonia, is born. Then on October 4th, Bobbert Jr., now 25, enlists in the army. Not necessarily out of any strong feelings of patriotism, though. He'd always been fascinated by airplanes, uh, didn't have the money for the flying lessons he wanted. He thought the military was the only way he could become a pilot, and, uh, and he would do well in the Army. By 1980, he was a warrant officer attending flight school in Fort Rucker, Alabama, graduated with a license to fly helicopters. Yates flew the OH-58 uh, Kiowa, the military version of the Bell Jet Ranger helicopter, single-engine, single-rotor military helicopter used for observation, utility, and direct fire support by the Army continuously from 1969 to 2017. Uh, also in 1980, third daughter, Michelle, is born. Uh, Junior quickly gains a reputation for being a skilled, safety-conscious pilot. Safety first. Don't want anyone to get hurt unless you're a couple of young lovers minding your own business in the woods on a picnic. Then sure, you're going to get killed. Safety first. Don't want anyone losing an eye. Makes it so much harder to do neighbor peeping. Uh, weird that he was watching the couple in the woods before shooting them. Flashing back on that now. Why did he have a shirt off? Masturbating? How long had he been there watching them? How many other people or couples had he watched before them? Then he drills that hole in the attic. How many times did he watch the neighbors have sex before being caught by his wife? Did he fantasize about killing them too? Is that, is that what did it for him at this, this point? Just watching people, maybe watching the, them in some sort of sexual act, thinking about killing them? Uh, sometime in 1981, Bobby and Linda's fourth daughter, Amber, is born. Then from October 81 to February 84, uh, Yates works as a helicopter pilot in the 503rd Aviation Unit in Europe. He and his family are stationed now in Hanau, Germany, just outside of Frankfurt, birthplace of the Brothers Grimm, suck subject 177. And supposedly, at least according to one documentary on Yates, a disproportionate number of sex workers go missing from Hanau uh, during this period. Uh, from February to October 1984, Yates works as a support aviator in the Brigade Support Company, Aviation Training Brigade, Fort Rucker, Alabama, the Army's Flight Training Center. It's back in Alabama, uh, back in the Bama. Yates became certified to fly civilian transport airplanes and helicopters during this time. From October 1984 through October 1987, still living with the fam in Alabama, uh, Yates serves as a support aviator at, at a different unit in Fort Rucker, takes classes to teach soldiers to fly Huey, heli Huey helicopters. Uh, did he peep on more neighbors during this period? Maybe murder some locals? Maybe travel to a nearby town? Kill some sex workers there? Don't know. From October 87 to May 88, Yates serves as a support aviator standardization pilot at Fort Rucker. Uh, takes an advanced aviation class. From May 1988 to May 1991, Yates teaches other soldiers to fly helicopters while serving in the 1st Infantry Division based in Cook Barracks in Göppingen, Germany. 1989, his son, his fifth and final child, is born. And again, it seems as if, uh, based on statements made in a documentary on Yates, that an unusual amount of sex workers go missing around Cook Barracks during Yates' time over there in Germany. Backing up a bit to December 28th, 1988, uh, the body of 23-year-old Stacy E. Hahn is discovered in Skagit County, Washington, just outside of Mount Vernon, Yates' old stomping grounds. Stacy was a sex worker from Seattle who was most likely killed sometime around July 7th, 1988. Guess who was home visiting the fam at that time? Yes, 36-year-old Junior, Bobby Junior, BJ. Stacy had been shot once in the head. Initially, people believed she might be a victim of the Green River Killer, right? Previous time suck topic, Mr. Clean Ween himself, Gary Ridgway, uh, but Yates later admitted to her murder and described her location and various injuries. From May 1991 through June 1995, Yates serves as a platoon leader, teaches soldiers to fly uh, Kiowa helicopters in the 3rd Battalion, 25th Aviation Regiment, Assault Helicopter Battalion, based in Fort Drum, New York. Also takes another warrant officer course. 1992, Yates participates in a relief mission in South Florida after Hurricane Andrew. Probably killed a sex worker or two. What a strange double life, right? Helping out people on relief missions, training fellow pilots, safety first, providing for his wife and five kids, maybe shooting some sex workers in the head. 1993, Yates flies choppers in Somalia as part of a UNISOM-1 uh, UN peacekeeping mission. UNISOM-1 began it, or began on, rather, uh, April 24th, 1992, meant to monitor the ceasefire in Mogadishu and escort deliveries of humanitarian supplies to distribution centers. 
The mission was enlarged to protect humanitarian convoys and distribution centers throughout the country. Uh, UNISOM 2 launched on March 26, 1993 to establish a secure environment for humanitarian assistance in Somalia through disarmament and reconciliation. And while stationed in Somalia, Yates gets into a little bit of trouble. Uh, he'd grown tired of eating military rations and decided to shoot a wild pig while flying his helicopter. And then he and his fellow soldiers had a barbecue. Bobby was almost court-martialed for this, but got off with a warning. One of Yates' associates said they tried to court-martial him because he didn't go through the proper channels. It all turned into a big joke after a while. It didn't hurt a damn thing. They were just trying to get some fresh meat. Apparently, Yates was a hell of a shot. Apparently, he killed a moving pig uh, in one shot from a moving helicopter. Dude was good with guns. And, uh, that skill would serve him well in the military. Also would help him kill a lot of, a lot of innocent people in the U.S. Uh, early 1994, Yates takes a vacation in Washington and purchases 1977 white Corvette from a woman named Sarah Marsh in Walla Walla. I wonder if he revisited the site of his first murders. Went out into the woods, take his shirt off, jerk off in the bushes a little bit, pretend he's firing on a, a, a couple needless shots at strangers. 1994, Yates participates in Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti now, another UN peacekeeping mission. Many sex workers went missing while he was there. It is not mentioned in sources. From July 1995 to March 1996, Yates serves uh, uh, back in Bama, serves as a flight leader in the 1st Battalion, 212th Aviation Regiment at Fort Rucker. Linda begins to notice a different side to her husband at this time. Uh, anytime she goes to a party with his coworkers, they seem surprised that old Junior has a wife. Not a good sign. She saw that after uh, he had a few drinks, he would openly flirt with other women in front of her and lie about his life. Really not a good sign. <laughs> Married? Me? No, no, no. That's, that's, that's not my wife. That's some lady I feel sorry for. You know who I don't feel sorry for? Hookers, am I right? <laughs> Maybe I shoot them sometimes. <laughs> what? Who said that? Dude, come on. I'm just having fun. I'm just joshing. We're just partying. March of 1996, Yates ends his career in the army after 18 and a half years of service. This is very weird. Leaves with the rank of Chief Warrant Officer 4, highest rank a warrant officer could earn. Had over 5,000 hours of flight time without a single mishap. I mean, just, you know, the little pig thing, but that's not a flight mishap. Uh, earns a Master Army Aviator Award. Well respected, no problems with fellow officers. 18 months shy of a 20 year career mark, right? When he would have received full retirement benefits. This is a father of five, breadwinner. Yates offers no explanation for his early retirement. Why not stay that extra year and a half? Some speculated he left because the government was replacing the type of helicopters he specialized in flying. The military was also offering early out benefits for those who retired voluntarily. He might have been bored, wanted to move on, but I doubt it. He still would have got more if he would have stayed that year, extra year and a half. Uh, others suspect he retired because he was involved in a different murder. Bingo, bango! I think this is the one. August 9th, 1995, local police found the body of Terion Corbett. Corbett was a male sex worker dressed in women's clothing. His body was found along a road between Ozark and Midland City uh, near Fort Rucker. And the police suspected a military man in his death. Bobby was in the area at the time of his death with no alibi. He has never confessed to Corbett's murder, but this is definitely suspicious. Overall, during his time in the Army, Baba earned several awards and medals, three Army Achievement Medals, three Army Commendation Medals, two Armed Forces Expeditionary Medals, three Meritorious Service Medals, and a Humanitarian Service Medal. Then the Father Five stops 18 months short of a full retirement. Suspicious to me. April of 1996, Yates' family moves to the South Hill in Spokane, Washington. Uh, takes the family there, settles down in that suburban home we talked about earlier. Yates was initially uh, unemployed for several months after he settled into Spokane. Yeah, he didn't seem too upset about it. Junior seemed like a, seemed like a great dad, right? He's taking his kids hunting, fishing, camping. Uh, they're, you know, they're new in town and getting to familiarize himself with the place. He's taken them to the parks and museums. But according to daughter Amber, there was a different polar opposite side to Yates at home. She said he was a bully. He was never physically abusive towards Linda, but he was towards the kids. Weird that she says Linda instead of mom, but yeah. Uh, his daughter Michelle says, we would be afraid. If we didn't do what he said, uh, he might harm us or scream at us or yell at us, be mean to us. Amber described one incident in a documentary interview years later where she had been playing outside all day, didn't want to come inside to use the bathroom. She held her for as long as she could and then ran inside to use the bathroom. Uh, she says her dad then blocked her way, grabs her ankle, picks her up, shakes her until she pees herself, then drops her on her head hard enough to uh, knock her unconscious. Fucking weird. What the hell was that about? Dude let out a bit too much of his uh, true dark nature at home maybe there. Uh, Junior's kids would say that their mom rarely went, went against what their dad wanted because she was afraid of being on her own without financial support. 
According to Michelle, Yates treated Linda like she was stupid, uh, constantly tried to embarrass her. At some point in 1987, Linda did leave, uh, left Robert, took the kids with her to go stay with her family in a location not disclosed in sources. But then Linda returned a year and a half later uh, for financial reasons, it seems. Junior would not support his family financially if they left him. Of course not. He only really cares about himself. When the family returns, Junior, angrier than ever, they've embarrassed him. The children become the primary targets of his violent outbursts. Michelle said one day he'd be happy, the next he'd be really mean. I don't know if he watched the Waltons. I wanted a family like that because I envied that type of family. Linda said that she came back because the girls missed their dad, but also mostly because they missed the money he was now cutting them off from. She said they didn't want to be poor and not have anything anymore. She added, I had hoped that coming back home to Washington would help the marriage, but it really didn't. The romance was gone, but I felt guilty about splitting up the family. The kids loved their dad, and I just kind of suffered through it. A lot of back and forth about the kids and Bob, right? They loved him. They miss him. He's an abusive asshole. So sad. Even when your parents are pieces of shit, right? Most of us still love them. Hardwired to do so. A strong biological imperative there. Uh, Linda added, I didn't love him like a wife should. He killed that. And of course, he was killing more than his wife's spirit. Uh, June 14th, 1996, the body of 39-year-old Shannon Selinsky, Yates' first known Spokane victim, is found in Spokane, Washington. Right after I completed my freshman year at Gonzaga in Spokane. Uh, some killer. Uh, wouldn't be on my radar, though. First murder doesn't get any real press. Uh, Shannon was found near the intersection of Mount Spokane Park Drive and Holcomb Road. Rural, forested area about two miles from uh, where Lindsay and I got married. In Green Bluff, Washington, actually. Back in 2016. Just a couple miles from where we uh, go apple and pumpkin picking every fall with the kids. The day she died, Shannon wore a gray dress and a towel covered her dead body. Pantyhose socks, one shoe lay nearby. Shannon had been shot with a 25 caliber gun. Fingerprint analysis identified her. Decomposition and a nasty shot to her head made it difficult to identify her by sight. Shannon was involved in sex work uh, and drug use before her murder. All of Bob's Spokane area victims would share this same history. Actually, all of his known victims except the first two would. Strange to me how he shot the first two from a distance. The rest up close and personal. Uh, people he spoke to, people he had sex with first, it seemed. That must have turned him on more, I guess. Become part of his fantasy to have sex with everyone he's killing. Shannon was last seen May 27th, 1 p.m. near East Sprague Avenue. Right, the, uh, the Spokane's uh, red light district of, source, of sorts. Part of that strip, less than a mile from the campus of Gonzaga, just across the Spokane River. Shannon was drinking alcohol with a group of men. Uh, before she disappeared, officer made contact with them, didn't arrest anyone. Witnesses saw her leave a house that evening to go to work, wearing a gray dress and black boots. Junior's eldest daughter, Sasha, 21, still living at home with this point. She worked nights for certified security systems. And uh, I believe earlier, I, I might've said the first was like Sonia and repeated that. It's, yeah, so it's Sasha's first. Uh, she worked for certified security systems. I remember seeing a building with that sign on it somewhere around uh, uh, kind of like <laughs> downtown Spokane. Anyway, uh, Bobby had driven her to work before heading off to go have sex with her, uh, to go have sex with and kill Shannon. He dropped Sasha off 11 p.m. then didn't come home. 2.30 a.m., Linda locked the doors, goes to sleep. 6.30 a.m., Bobby wakes her up, banging on the front door. When she let him in, uh, he runs to their cleaning closet, grabs anything he can find, runs back out to his van, and uh, it, he was like covered in blood. Bobby explained that while he was driving, he hit a dog. Uh, he and the dog's owner put it in the back of the van and, you know, took it to a vet. And Linda doubted that story, as she should have. W why would you not call home if that was true? Why be in such a rush to clean your van when you get home if that's true? In September of 1996, Yates is hired to assemble circuit boards at Pantroll, that company in Spokane I mentioned earlier. His boss described him as a quiet worker who seemed fairly average and friendly enough. Over the next see, just, again, he just blends in. Uh, doesn't stand out in any way. Over the next few months, his kids realize something's going on with dad. Daughter Sonia, now 19, finds condoms, women's phone numbers in dad's car. You know, it's not looking good. Uh, she calls some of the women, asks them who they are. She gives uh, all the evidence to her mom, Linda, who confronts Bobby about it. He denies everything and their marriage just keeps limping along. Oh man, sad. What a sad example for the kids here. All right, you catch a guy with condoms, women's phone numbers written down in his, his car. He denies it and then you just kind of shrug your shoulders and move on. What a sad way to live. But if she leaves, as we know, Bob cuts her off financially. She has no work experience, no resume, uh, five kids. She's in a tough spot. In hindsight, yeah, again, guessing she uh, wishes she would have left him after catching him peeping on those neighbors from the attic when they were younger and she just had one kid with him. Uh, April of 1997, Yates joins the military again. This time, joins the Washington State National Guard as Chief Warrant Officer 4. 
assigned to A Company, 1st Battalion, 185th Aviation, component unit of the 66th Aviation Brigade Headquarters at Fort Lewis near Tacoma. And you'll have to go to uh, the Tacoma area often. Why did he enlist? Seems to be a combination of money and love of flying. And he was good at it. And maybe he wanted to kill some women in Tacoma, shake things up a little bit. Uh, Chief Warrant Officer 3, Jay Enders, who flew with Yates, the National Guard, said he was a true professional, very proficient. Bobby Yates was uh, grounded, though, from flying from spring 1997 to spring 1998. There was some type of never fully disclosed medical issue. And during this time, more women began to disappear. I don't know if uh, it's coincidence or if he's very frustrated, he can't fly, do what he wants to do. I would love it if the medical issue that didn't allow him to fly uh, was literally that his wiener was just unusually small. I don't know why that got stuck in my head. Like somehow, <laughs> and I know this doesn't actually make any sense, but somehow his wiener is so small that they're worried it would affect his confidence to the point it would make it dangerous for him to fly. Well, like some superiors like, sorry, Bob, we, we got to get additional medical clearance to get you back up there in the air. <laughs> what? Come on. Why? Why? Do I really have to say it, Bob? Say what? My eyesight is perfect. I have an impeccable flight record. Hundreds and hundreds of hours. Is, is this because I shot that one pig in Somalia? It's your dick, Bob. It's just, it's so fucking small. It's very concerning. Jesus, Mark, what the fuck? What can my dick have to do with my flight abilities? And, and Linda says it's huge, by the way. It's not huge, Bob. Some of the female pilots ha have clits bigger than your dick. They've been measured. We just don't see how it's possible for you to consistently concentrate on flying anything with a dick that small. Me and the guys have talked about it at length. And we all agreed that if our dicks were that small, any flight we were piloting would have no more than a 50% chance of landing without crashing. Half the time, at least, we would want to just kill ourselves just to not live with that tiny, tiny, tiny dick anymore. Come on, Mark! Uh, I don't know. Uh, apologize to any pilots with teeny, teeny, tiny dicks who listen to the show. I've, I've actually heard that's one of our bigger demographics. JK. Just being absurd. Uh, August 26, 1997, the body of 25-year-old Heather Hernandez, now found in Spokane, Washington. Witness Larry Jones was looking in a field for empty soda cans to recycle. At 11 a.m., he finds a body hidden beneath a tree on East Springfield Ave. Just a few blocks north of the intersection of Sprague and Freya, close to some train tracks, uh, an industrial area. I've driven through that intersection countless times, just over a mile from Gonzaga. About a mile from where I was uh, living that summer, actually. I was headed off to uh, to London to go to school there for a semester at that time. First time I'd ever flown internationally. I'm off on some grand life-changing adventure. And a woman just five years older than me is having her life snuffed out by a monster. Not far from where I was living. Wonder if Heather and I ever crossed paths. Heather was found wearing only a shirt and a bra. The text of the, at the scene uh, found almost a gallon of blood. Almost a gallon splattered across a nearby parking lot. Jesus. They assumed the uh, killer dragged the body from the parking lot across an embankment, uh, hid the victim beneath a tree with garbage. The body was so decomposed, the police almost couldn't uh, tell the gender. Uh, Heather was a drifter originally from Phoenix, and not many people in the area knew her. Then at 5 p.m. the same day, witness Kevin Kalin found a second decomposed body at 9800 Forker Road, Spokane County, about six miles from where I would live almost a decade later, when Kyler Monroe were born uh, in Millwood, Washington. It was six miles from Millwood, not in Millwood, but to be clear. The body lay underneath a pine tree in the Mount Spokane foothills, 12 miles north of Sprague Avenue. There were a few scattered groves of pines along the road in this area. Next to that, lots of farmland. Kevin Kalen and his family owned an alfalfa farm in Spokane, and Kalen noticed a rotting smell coming from a wooden area. At first, he thought it was a dead animal, not unusual in an area like that, you know, maybe a deer carcass. But then it shocked to discover a body hidden in tall grass near the base of a tree. The body severely decomposed. The police initially could only guess that the woman was most likely Asian, Indian, or black, and that the victim had been killed by a close-range gunshot to the chest. Her blouse had been pulled up over her bra, her bra pulled over her head and neck. The police could tell from dirt and grass stains that she'd been dragged by her ankles, then by her head to her final resting place. Also noted that the left wrist cuff button of her blouse is missing. This button will eventually be found and go a long ways to helping nail this motherfucker. Uh, the police spent days searching the crime scene, and the work paid off. They found a condom near the road, pair of heels, underwear, broken car radio antenna, blood stains, bloody towel, and strands of the victim's long dark hair. This information won't help the investigation right away, but it will connect Yates, you know, to this crime a few years later. Autopsy identifies the victim, you know, 16-year-old Jennifer Joseph, born October 6, 1980, so young, 
Uh, Yates is 45 at this point. This girl is as young or younger than all four of his daughters. So extra fucked up. Parents John and Mihai Joseph provided blood samples in case it would ever be necessary to establish a biological link between themselves and their daughter. The medical examiner collected fibers from Jennifer's body, shoes, and the towel found with her. There were also light brown uh, head hairs on the towel. Detectives had one lead in Jennifer's case. Witness Yolanda Carey saw her getting into a white Corvette August 16th at 1135 p.m. This will also eventually help nail this motherfucker. Uh, If not for details related to Jennifer's crime scene, God knows how much longer he would have kept killing. Detectives uh, began compiling a list of white Corvette owners in eastern Washington. They cross-referenced that list with people who had been stopped by police in the area, frequented by sex workers, and identified in field reports. Yates' name does come up on this list, but he is unfortunately not questioned. Right? He's a military guy, father of five. It can't be him. Jennifer had been posing as uh, Jennifer Kim, 19 years old. She and Heather actually knew each other. They ran in the same circles, but weren't friendly. Uh, some sex workers on Sprague Avenue did not like Jennifer because she got more business than they did. They thought it was because she was young and a pretty Asian girl. Her father was in the army, traveled often. Mom lived in Hawaii. She could have had such a bright future. She was a talented pianist, talented singer, had a strong will, very stubborn. How did she end up where she ended up? Well, she began hanging out with the wrong crowd in junior high. Her grades fell. Then soon she dropped out of school. She'd recently promised her dad she'd go back if she could first travel throughout the summer. Right before she went missing, she told her dad that she could take care of herself and that he shouldn't worry about her anymore. Her dad had no idea that she was a sex worker. All he knew was that she was living in Spokane with her new boyfriend. Uh, He and her boyfriend paid for her living expenses. Jennifer was living with her boyfriend, Marlon, who last saw her on August 16th, 3 p.m. A cab had picked her up from a motel, took her to work. She called him at 9 p.m., said she'd be home by midnight, but then, of course, Jennifer did not come home. Marlon asked some other girls if they'd seen her. Uh, heard stories. Uh, he heard stories about her getting into a white car driven by a middle-aged man. Marlon insisted to the police that he was not Jennifer's pimp. Jennifer left on her own each day to go to work, and he didn't know where she went. So how is Yates not questioned here? He's a middle-aged man. He drives a white Corvette. I highly doubt he had an alibi, right? He was in that, uh, a frequent customer of sex workers in that area. His daughters already suspect him of being a fucking dirtbag. His wife knows he's a dirtbag. There's going to be DNA linking him to the crime. Feels like a huge screw up. How many middle-aged guys could have possibly been driving white Corvettes in Spokane at this time? 50, 100 tops. How many of them frequented the area? I mean, what, just a handful. But I do realize that you can't just go to all these guys' houses and just interrogate them based on these details alone. Damn it. Jennifer's case, once reported in the local press, really ratchets up concern in the area amongst parents due to her age, right? Could their daughter be next? They couldn't believe such a young girl was working as a sex worker or that anyone would want to harm her. Around this time, Bobby Yates is uh, known to frequently disappear from home all night. Linda will uh, often ask the children, apparently, where's your dad? The family knows about the Spokane serial killer, but somehow, supposedly, never suspect Bobby. Come on, didn't at least one of them wonder in some quiet moment, is dad doing this? Didn't Linda ever think, could it be Bob? I think they had to have wondered. On September 24th, 1997, Yates has an encounter with the police on the corner of Sprague and Ralph. Right in front of Axel's Pawn. For Spokane listeners, I actually bought my uh, college desktop computer, a compact PC, weighed about uh, 7,000 pounds. Well, actually, my mom bought it for me, to be honest. Uh, thank you, mom. A-, a block or two from this location. Some electronic store that's no longer there. Kyler went to school at the Libby Center just a few blocks away. Several years back, great school for gifted kids. Man, picking them up from school sometimes or dropping them off sometimes early in the morning. I would find it sad that sex workers would still walk in the area. You know, even in the morning, a cold day out walking on the street wearing very little. Bobbert Jr. stopped for a traffic violation while driving a white Corvette, but not sighted. Officer did see this vehicle was on a list of suspicious vehicles the police were searching for. So when Yates failed to properly signal a lane change, the officer did pull him over. But then the officer fucked up and wrote down in his uh, report that he was driving a white Camaro, not a Corvette. Unfortunate mistake that may have led to Bob getting away with all this uh, quite a bit longer, claiming quite a few more victims. November f- uh, 5th, 1997, the body of 29-year-old Darla Scott is found in a rural area of Hangman Valley, Spokane, Washington, about six miles from Sprague Avenue, on the south side of town now, right next to the Lataw Creek Golf Course. Right off of State Highway 195, the road I've driven God knows how many times to travel back and forth between Spokane and Riggins, Idaho to visit family. Witness Harold D. Lebsock was walking his dog when he found a decomposing body near South 12,600 Hangman Valley Road. For the past five days, his dog had been attracted to this specific spot and he finally decided to go check it out. The body's buried in a shallow grave about 60 feet from the road, dumped near a small creek. 
Head, arm, leg are visible. Rest of the body is buried. Police find a partial grave near the body as if the killer changed his mind, uh, decided to bury uh, her elsewhere, uh, but then didn't. The body was severely decomposed with several bites taken out by animals. The victim wore a blue shirt with a Mickey Mouse print on the front, two basic, uh, two plastic bags found on her head, right, covering her head, no purse, wallet, money, no digging tools found at the site. Detectives determined someone must have drove a car to dump the victim at the site. On November 7th, the medical examiner performed an autopsy, determined that the victim had died from two gunshot wounds to the head from a 25 caliber gun or smaller. Oral, anal, vaginal swabs are collected like they will be from every victim here on out, from here on out. And, uh, you know, the DNA gathered will help nail Bob later. November 12th, forensics team identifies the victim as Darla. Uh, she has a history of sex work, drug use, right? She's estranged from her parents, has one child. She quit drugs while she was pregnant, hoped her uh, baby would help change her life. But addiction, as we have talked about many times before, can be so fucking powerful, especially opiates, uh, which is what uh, almost all these women were addicted to. She went back to doing drugs shortly after giving birth. Darla had been to rehab, rehab at least five times, but never stayed longer than two weeks. Her mom later said no amount of love could keep her from traveling a dark path. God, if only it was that simple, right? If only love could rewire someone's brain chemistry and conquer addiction, just nothing but love. But that is sadly not the case. Important to remember that not all these victims came from uh, broken homes. Not all of them had terrible parents. Sometimes a couple poor choices, a couple bad circumstances can completely derail a once promising life. Good parenting reduces the odds that you're going to end up in a situation like this, but doesn't guarantee you won't, sadly. Last time Darla spoke to her baby's father uh, a few weeks back in October, her twin sister reported her missing, but no one was too concerned, figured she had relapsed, ran off with the trucker again. She'd been in a relationship with the trucker previously and traveled around the country and didn't let people know where she was. Last person to see Darla was her boyfriend, Arthur. They'd recently gotten in a fight because of her sex work. She'd gotten in a car with a client who uh, previously had been violent with her. Detectives now think that one of Darla's clients or associates must have killed her. Darla was also known around town as a thief and had several enemies that were now suspects. Police do not expect Bob. Again, he's a good, he's a good family guy. He's a hardworking veteran and machinist. Father five, Christian. He's one of the good guys. Uh, I'm still studying abroad at this point, removed from campus gossip about all this, just living in my little bubble, completely oblivious to this ongoing series of tragedies. Speaking of tragedy, December 7th, 1997, body of 24-year-old Melinda Mercer found, not in Spokane, but on the other side of the state in Pierce County, Washington. Witness Edward Jameson found a nude female body at 3800 South 50th, Tacoma, just two blocks from South Park and a few cemeteries, about half a mile west of I-5, not a secluded area. Not really. Uh, the victim was left out in the open. Investigators found a 25 caliber casing at the site, just like with the Spokane murders. And Bobbert was in the area for some National Guard duties. But because Junior is not a suspect, no one is able to connect this crime to the Spokane murders at this time. No purse, wallet, money are left in the scene. Uh, this is the case for all of Bobbert, Bobbert's sex worker victims. Investigators determined the killer used a vehicle to transport the victim to the crime scene. Uh, she had four plastic bags around her head, had been shot three times. Damn. The medical examiner performed the autopsy December 8th, determined the cause of death. Of course, the three gunshot wounds to the head. Feels like Junior was especially angry here. First time, according to crime reports, that he has shot one of his sex worker victims uh, that many times. Two bullets are recovered. The victim was identified as Melinda L. Mercer, right? Uh, 20, yeah, as I said, 24 years old. Melinda was a waitress who occasionally turned to sex work for extra money. She started sex work in November of 1997 to buy heroin, fucking opiates. Last seen alive December 6, 1997, leaving a tavern in Seattle to walk Aurora Avenue to make some money. She had no ties to Tacoma. Mom described her as a loving girl who was running in a fast world. December 18th, 1997, yet another dead woman's body turns up. Back on the eastern side of the state now. Body of 36-year-old Sean Johnson found in Spokane. Maintenance workers find her body in the 11,400 block of South Hangman Valley Road near a waste uh, water treatment station, only a few thousand feet from where the body of uh, victim Darla Scott had turned up. The killer made no attempt to conceal her remains except for a, a bit of leaves and foliage. Investigators determined that the killer used a vehicle to transport the victim to the crime scene. And like at least one previous victim, she had two plastic bags covering her head. The medical examiner performed the autopsy December 22nd. The cold weather preserved the body. Investigators had more evidence to work with than some of the previous victims. Sean died from two gunshot wounds right to the head. Two bullets are recovered. Uh, what, is, what is the deal with multiple close-range shots to the head? Again, it just feels like rage. Some of her diary entries, Sean sadly wrote that she did not want uh, she did not want to be a sex worker. All she wanted was to have a family, a loving husband, but the drugs were always pulling at her. This was the easiest way she had found to make the money that she needed to buy the drugs. 
Sean's mother told the police she was a known drug user. She contracted the, or, or sorry, she contacted the police after she hadn't heard from her daughter in a while. Sean had previously worked at a Chevron station, taco restaurant, and an oil company. She'd had a few kids with a few boyfriends over the years. She'd been picked up a few times for shoplifting. When she died, she owed some drug dealers money for drugs. Uh, so the police are led in the wrong direction when it comes to suspects initially. December 22nd, 1997, Spokane Serial Killer Task Force is now formed. It consists of four officers, two from the Spokane County Sheriff's Office, two from Spokane Police Department, also assisted by a local FBI office. The task force notes that all the victims were killed with a 25 caliber gun. Plastic bags are placed over the women's heads after being shot where the killer, uh, that's the killer's signature. They believe that the killer most likely used the bags to keep the blood contained since the victims didn't die of suffocation. The killer dumped the bodies in secluded locations, but locations that were near well-traveled roads and in close proximity to each other. Almost all the victims were killed in one place, dumped in another. Forensic scientists gathered everything they could from the crime scenes. Acrylic fibers, hair clippings, grass clippings, DNA samples, bullets, plastic bags, clothing, other debris, and sent it off to the state crime lab for comparison and analysis. The task force decides to compile a list of all the missing sex workers in the area. That list will include four future victims who have gone missing but are not dead yet. Instead of waiting for the women to show up dead, homicide detectives began searching for them early, appealing to the public for help. On December 26, 1997, the bodies of 31-year-old Laurel Wason uh, and 39-year-old Sean M McClenahan are discovered together in Spokane, Washington. Witness Rick Delante finds both victims near East 4800 Hangman Valley Road. Four bodies now, unless my math is off, uh, to be found near the Lataw Creek Golf Course. I will never look at that place the same way again. Laurel found in the gravel uh, pit, uh, her head covered by three plastic bags. One of them contained a folded paper towel. She died from two gunshot wounds to the head. Foreign vegetation, peanut shells, packing styrofoam, chips of uh, concrete found covering her body. Semen found on her body. The other victim, Sean McClenahan, found near Laurel, stuffed into a gully in the woods. She'd been covered by three plastic bags, shot in the head twice. Semen also found in her body. And a fingerprint on one of the plastic bags is recovered. Like Laurel, foreign matter covered her body, right? Bags were from different stores, Safeway, Kmart, Shopco, Albertsons, but didn't lead to any clues about the killer. It was clear that Laurel was much more decomposed than Sean. The police wondered, did the killer leave Laurel there, then dump Sean near her later? Uh, did he keep them somewhere else, dump both of them at the same time? Both victims had, like the others, you know, history of drug use and sex work. Both women also known amongst other sex workers as snitches, so the task force initially thinks that someone may have killed them out of revenge. Sean had previously helped put her drug dealer in prison with her testimony. Darla had lived with that same drug dealer before, also as a police informant. Police began making connections between these women and suspect the killer knew them both personally. Why right, did that dealer have them both killed? But, you know, with the bags, hmm, doesn't, doesn't seem likely. It seems, seems like this part of the serial killer. Sean attended Spokane Community College, worked in hospitals until she was diagnosed with carpal tunnel. Uh, could no longer work. She relied on pain pills, right, to manage her pain, fucking opiates. Then turns to sex work for drug money. Uh, Sean abusing heroin for the past four to five years. Sean last seen December 24th, 1997 before 6 p.m. A man who knew her uh, said he saw her crying in a grocery store parking lot, asked her what was wrong. She said she was upset about the state of her life, but she was looking forward to starting a methadone program. She said, next Christmas, I'll be so presentable, I'll be gift wrapped under the tree instead of unraveling out here in the street. Fuck. Junior took that possibility uh, away from her. Sean promised to call this friend of hers later that evening, but then never did. Kathy Lloyd, Sean's sister, knew something was wrong um, when she didn't show up for Christmas. The police informed her of her sister's death on the 26th. Laura was married, mother to one child, worked as a Rottweiler breeder. Uh, she'd been in remission for six years, but relapsed in 1996. She'd only somewhat recently gone back to sex work and been missing since October 30th. January 20th, 1998. Now, the FBI completes their profile of the serial killer. They have determined, bum ba da ba ba he is a white male, age 20 to 40, and maybe a loner. The task force does not find this profile uh, very fucking ho helpful. Of course not. God, that's... <laughs> Why even release it? That's so vague. Spoken, as I mentioned earlier, full of white male loners. I mean, you might as well say, the FBI profilers have determined that some dude is likely the killer. Great news, everyone. The FBI profilers are 90% certain that these women are being killed by a no-no dirty bad boy guy. Stop what you're doing, everybody. We got this motherfucker now. The FBI profilers have determined that the killer is definitely alive and probably a human being. Uh, at this point in the timeline, 
Uh, I'm now back from studying abroad, back on campus. Uh, there is some concern on campus about all this. Murders are being reported uh, a lot in the newspaper now, but GU's campus this time, you know, super insulated, su- such a little bubble. Most of us never read the paper, watched local news. I certainly didn't. Uh, I don't know anyone who did. There were the townies, and then there was us. Most of us, if we did venture from campus, you know, we left town or went to a concert, then right back. Maybe went hiking outside of the city. Almost never, ever went to East Break. My buddy Paul and I would buy discount ground beef from Sonnenberg's Deli. That was right in the heart of where the women Bob uh, killed worked. But we did that during the day. Had to get that cheap meat. Had to fuel our heavy on the hamburger helper young men uh, trying to bulk up diets. But not being women, we weren't that worried. Uh, I do remember being worried about an ex-girlfriend of mine once wandered around some house parties one night, put on by locals just off campus. Uh, she was a mess at that point. She was trying to make me uh, jealous. Uh, I wasn't, but I was worried that if I just left, something bad would happen to her and I would uh, you know, feel bad about it for the rest of my life. I was worried that the, maybe the serial killer could be at one of these parties. I don't know. I don't know that she was that worried though. I think most girls on campus figured that if they just um, you know, stayed away from Sprague Avenue, they would be fine. Actually, to show how insulated we were during the height of all this, uh, these women being taken literally just a mile away off campus, uh, I sang a song called Spokane Man. I wrote on guitar for an annual Saturday Night Live type production Gonzaga would put on called uh, Waiting on FM every spring. Wish I could remember the lyrics. Uh, but, you know, just kind of mocking the surroundings and crime and different things. Like, you know, wasn't that worried, clearly. Uh, looking back at the campus surrounding area, uh, such a good example of the divide between the haves and the have-nots. It was almost like, like, oh man, that's, that sure sucks for people not on campus having to deal with a serial killer. Good thing we live in a very different place. Uh, Gonzaga's location is so interesting to me this way, right? You have all these kids. My family wasn't rich, but a lot of the Gonzaga family is doing pretty well. And, and these kids placed in the Logan neighborhood of Spokane, which at the time I went to school was one of the worst neighborhoods in the state of Washington for crime and poverty. In 2000, the annual income of residents in this neighborhood was under 11,000 per person, Right per year, age 15 and older, at that time compared to 62% of Spokane households having all parents living in the house in the workforce, only 21% of homes with parents in the Logan neighborhood had parents working. 15% of all families there living below the poverty level compared to 11% citywide, and Spokane has a lot of other really impoverished neighborhoods, Uh, more thefts and burglaries, car break-ins, et cetera, than any other Spokane neighborhood at that time. I had a couple different friends get mugged going to house parties, knew of a girl who... um, got raped by someone who broke into her house, climbed in through her fucking bedroom window, lived just off campus. Stories of other girls, uh, victims of sex crimes, you know, right off campus. But even after those crimes, there was still a feeling that as long as you stayed on campus, you were safe. It was like some weird base. You didn't have to worry about, you know, what happened over on Sprague or in the Logan neighborhood. It's like, no, 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 I'm on base. I'm on base. You can't tag me. Can't hurt me. You just ignore it all. Crazy. Bunch of college kids at a private Catholic university, Many from affluent families near other kids the same age, in some cases, walking East Sprague at night, hoping the John who pays to have sex with them is in the Spokane serial killer while we're going to some fucking house party, having the time of our lives. February 8th, 1998, discovered that another local woman meets a monster. Body of 41-year-old Sonny Oster, or Oster, I believe it's Oster, is found in Spokane. Witness Michael Cummings found her body at the 17,000 block of South Graham Road, laying in the cluster of trees by the side of the road, just a few miles from the campus of Eastern Washington University uh, over in Cheney, less than 20 miles from uh, you know the area of East Sprague Avenue, frequented by sex workers in Spokane. Uh, the witness was out walking their dogs and horses, found clothes and a foot poking out from a pile of debris. Again, right? No purse, wallet, money found at the scene. Again, investigators determined the killer uh, drove a vehicle to the dump site. The body severely decomposed, so much so, again, difficult to determine the victim's gender. The victim dumped into a ditch, face down, covered in weeds and grass, Animals had gotten into the remains. She'd been shot twice in the head, head covered by three plastic bags. Sonny reportedly had a happy childhood, but experienced some type of trauma in high school that made her turn to drugs. Sources don't uh, uh, say explicitly what kind of trauma it was. Dropped out of high school at the age of 17 after getting pregnant. Has two kids. Uh, is a good person. Cared for her stepmom when her stepmom was uh, fighting cancer. She wanted a normal life. She wanted to go to rehab. Her family wanted her to stay close to home. So she checked into a Spokane facility, September 16th, 1997. Discharged October 2nd. Reported missing December 24th. Last seen in November at First Step Services, a detox center. When her family hadn't heard from her in a while, they contacted the police. After Yates' trial, her mom, Andrea Smith, would tell a local journalist, journalist, does anybody know what he does to dead girls after they're dead? Does anybody know he has sex with them after they're dead like he did my sonny? 
Yeah, that is something that will be referenced at Yates, uh, at Yates' second trial. Uh, if I, I think I mentioned that in the very beginning of the show, but not since. So maybe necrophilia, his main sexual motive in these crimes. The task force now decides to fly a helicopter over some of the dump sites. The aircraft has thermal imaging equipment, can reveal more bodies, but they find nothing. April 1st, 1998, another body turns up. The remains of 34-year-old Linda Mabin. Witnesses Glenn and Mary Moore find her body at East 4800 14th Street. Out by Cheney again, like the previous victim. Glenn and Mary out walking, see a partially clothed person just the side of the road at the bottom of a ditch. Two plastic bags covering her head. Her her autopsy takes place uh, on April 3rd. She died of a single gunshot wound to the head. So he must have uh, have really liked her. Only one shot. Uh, The bullet was recovered. An unusual, or sorry, not unusual, an unused pink condom retrieved from Linda's anus. So strange. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, An aborted attempt at necrophilia, perhaps. Maybe thought about using the condom for necrophilia, but then decided against it. Linda also involved, of course, in sex work and drug use. Last seen November 22nd, reported missing by her friends. Spokane Serial uh, Killer Task Force now hires PhD Richard Old to examine debris found around some of the bodies and on some of the bodies. And yes, his name is Richard Old, as in Dick Old. And he has a PhD. So, Dr. Dick Old. This is fantastic. Dr. Old Dick earned his PhD from the Department of Plant Science at the University of Idaho, where I'm sure no one ever talked shit about his name. We Idahoans are known as a whole, culturally, as uh, having a very sophisticated sense of humor and never mock anyone for names related to genitalia. Professor Geriatric Cock has a master's in agronomy and soils from Washington State University. Uh, He had worked 24 years in plant and weed identification and forensic botany. He is a huge fucking nerd, but a very helpful one. He determined that the debris was composed of lace, leaf, maple, birch, rose, hydrangea, Oregon grape, maple, honey locusts, and uh, peanut shells, cherry pits, white paint chips, pieces of concrete. He figures all out, decorative bark, and he determines this debris is probably coming from a yard, someone's yard, coming from the same yard, maybe the killer's yard. Interesting. Is this this really going to help catch Yates? No, it's not. But I wanted to include these details because his name is Dick Old. May 1998, Yates is still grounded from flying because, you know, his wiener is still too small. We can't let you up. Bob, we've gone over this. There is no fucking way you can consistently concentrate on flying with a dick that tiny. It's shameful. No, he's still grounded, though, due to delays in processing his medical examination. Uh, Performance evaluation notes that his morale and dedication remain high despite not being able to fly. Yeah, of course his morale's high. He's, He's having a great time, constantly murdering, Innocent young women all around town. Uh, he's probably whistling, grinning at work. Same month, he sells his white Corvette to a woman named Rita Jones in Spokane. Wonder how creeped out Rita was two years later when she'll learn the, what went on in that Corvette. Can you imagine finding out the car you've been driving around was used to, uh, to murder numerous women or numerous women, you know, murdered in the car? May 12th, 1998, 43-year-old Melody Murphin goes missing from Spokane. Not, El- not much is known about Melody other than she was also a sex worker, struggled with drug addiction, knew some of the other victims, her body will show up uh, after Yates is caught in uh, a very interesting location. We'll talk about that when it comes up. July 7th, 1998, the body of 47-year-old Michelin Durning found in Spokane, just a few blocks from Sprague Avenue, North 218 Crest Line, less than half mile uh, from where I got my first tattoo, just a year or two after all this, at Tiger Tattoo, less than a half mile from Sonnenberg's Market and Deli getting that hamburger helper meat for, from, for a great price, less than a mile from Gonzaga's campus. Witness Gordon Oland found her. Her body was found naked in an empty parking lot, partially covered by branches and a hot tub cover. That's so random. She also was uh, found right next to Pantrol, where Yates worked. This dude worked about a thousand feet from where Kyler went to school for a couple of years. Nuts. Uh, worked just a few blocks off East Sprague, where these women walked at night, hoping to pick up Johns. Uh, worked less than a mile from where me and other students were studying and partying. Please actually speak to Yates and other workers, but he doesn't stand out at all, right? He's the average Joe. How do they not check to see if any of these guys owned or used to own white Corvettes? So easy to armchair detect this, though. I know. The medical examiner recovered a 25 caliber casing from Michelin's hair. Autopsy determined that she died from a gunshot wound to the head. She was originally from Southern California, enjoyed spending time on the beach with her son. Her mom had passed away from cancer in 1991, and then uh, she was her mother's caretaker for a few years. Then her life really seems to have fallen apart. 1997, after years of drug addiction, sex work, and homelessness, she came to Spokane to live with her close friend, Gregory Landis. 
seemed to be getting her life back on track, working several jobs, joining the church, considering going back to school for nursing. Uh, her most recent job was as a secretary, but then she started using again. And that led her into sex work again. She was supposed to go on a trip with her friend Gregory uh, when he uh, when she disappeared, trying to get her life back on track, but never uh, she never showed up for the trip. And she was last seen July 3rd, 1998. Summer of 98. Uh, back when I was interning for Child Protective Services, some of the families I worked with dealing with kids who had been taken uh, out of their homes, homes deemed not safe for these kids, and they weren't. Uh, some of the women in these families, you know, had been or were uh, uh, previously involved in sex work, many dealing with drug addiction, and they lived not far from where all this happened. Uh, I wonder if they worried about the killer. I don't, I don't remember asking them. I wonder if they knew some of these women. I don't remember personally worrying about any of this at the time. I was too busy jamming that summer with... Uh, a new little garage rock band, Who's Lewis? Gearing up to play uh, toadies and Pearl Jam covers at parties. Again, what a nice little bubble we Zags got to hide in during all this. August 1st, 1998. Yates picks up 32-year-old sex worker Christine Smith. She did not live in the Zag bubble. Yates picks her up uh, between 1 and 1.30 a.m. on East Sprague. Saturday night. I'm sure I was uh, fucking hammered somewhere. Uh, there wasn't a, uh, you know, probably a, a mile or less from where this happened. It wasn't a Saturday night that summer when I was not hammered. Uh, Bobbert driving a black 70s Ford van now, orange stripe on the passenger side exterior. Christine agrees to perform oral sex on him in the back of the van for 40 bucks. Uh, Yates uh, had installed a bed and mattress in the back, and he drives to a secluded parking lot in Spokane behind the Rockwood Clinic. I know exactly where this is. You can see it from the freeway. This place located at the base of the South Hill, less than half a mile from East Sprague Red Light Corridor. Excuse me. Also uh, less than a half mile from where I will get my first uh, post-college job at the Crisis Residential Treatment Center almost a year later. Almost exactly a year later, working with uh, area troubled teens. I wonder if any of them knew or related to any of Bob's victims. Christine could not find an interior door handle on the sliding van door once she got in. Wee bit concerning. Her spidey senses start tingling. She actually asks this guy, uh, are you the psycho killer that has been murdering prostitutes? And Yates responds, oh, fuck yeah. Uh, but don't be scared. Uh, I never killed anyone named Christine. Bad luck. And she's like, you promise? And he's like, pinky swear. And she's like, okay, okay, cool. And then they completed their transaction. Obviously not true. No, he said, I'm a respected National Guard helicopter pilot and the father of five children. You have nothing to fear. Pretty gross that he's using his family as a way to prove uh, to women he wants to kill that he's a good guy. I wonder how many victims he showed pictures of his kids uh, before murdering them. Also, how is uh, rationalizing, uh, um, how is, how, how is, like, this was his wife. How is Linda allowing him just to have a, a van with a fucking bed in the back of it? Right? How is how is he rationalize that to her? Just baby, sometimes I need to take naps at work. You know I like a nap. You know I get sleepy right after I come in another woman's vagina. What? Who, what? Who said that? Christine began performing oral sex on Yates, but after five to seven minutes, uh, he still has not become aroused. She's about to stop and ask what was wrong when she's struck by a sudden blow to the head. She almost loses consciousness, falls backwards. She'd actually been shot in the head, but the bullet had just grazed her. In the shock of all, all of this, uh, she didn't even realize a gun had gone off. How fucking crazy is that? Also, why did he randomly, randomly shoot her after she's going down on him for, you know, like roughly five minutes, over five minutes? I'm guessing because his impotence would have magically probably went away if he would have been able to have sex with her once she was dead. How the fuck do you get to a place like that in your head where, where that is what you need? M makes me think of Bob's reputation with the local sex workers that he didn't kill, right? Remember they said uh, he wasn't kinky. What if, what if that is where all this is coming from? What if he wasn't even comfortable being kinky with sex workers? Maybe he's too embarrassed. Maybe he's afraid of them teasing him. But if they're dead, they can't tease him. They can't tell anyone. And then he can be as kinky as he wants. Totally speculating here, but feels possible. Christine not going to find out how kinky or not he was. After he shoots her, just grazing her, she jumps out of the van, flees to St. Luke's Rehab Center, receives three stitches, still not realizing she has been shot. Yates demanded his money back while Christine made her way to the front of the van uh, to get the money from her pockets before fleeing. Um, as she's fleeing, uh, she remembers him saying, what are we doing here, Christine? Maybe not wanting to draw attention to himself to risk someone hearing him shoot at Christine or having her scream as he chases her. He doesn't chase her. You know, he's in an area with a fair amount of traffic nearby where there will be plenty of witnesses. So he just takes off. September of 1998, Yates gets laid off from his job at Pantrol. They thought he was a solid worker, but... They did not like uh, how he was talking about killing sex workers all the time. And it was starting to bother upper management. They were like, Bobby, Bobby, you're a great worker. A lot of the guys here love you, but uh, you're always talking about the women you're killing. 
showing guys their naked pictures, talking in great detail about how exactly he goes down, offering to drive guys to where you dump the bodies, inviting guys to kill with you on the weekends, talking about how fun sex with dead bodies is, and, uh, well, we got a couple crybabies here in the middle management. And, uh, you know, if I don't lay you off, uh, th- they've threatened to go to the police. <laughs> I know, I know it's, it, they're overreacting. We live in a crazy world. You know that I don't care what you do in your own time. That's not my business, but I, but I gotta let you go. We, we got customers who, who might take their business elsewhere if they figure out that one of our employees is a wanted serial killer. And of course, that's not uh, why they laid him off. They laid him off because his wiener was too small. God damn it. He's going to hurt somebody. He can't focus on the machines with that small of a wiener. He's going to hurt himself or someone else. I have no idea what let him go. Doesn't sound like he was fired. Uh, sounds like business slowed down. Uh, he was an okay worker, but not their best. And, you know, they made some cutbacks. September 19th, 1998, Yates is pulled over after picking up a known sex worker. He's asked to provide a DNA sample to the Spokane police to help them narrow down a suspect list for a local serial killer targeting sex workers, and he refuses. He tells the officers that that request was too extreme of an ask for a family man. Uh, officer, be reasonable. Think of my family. I am just a lowly, God-fearing family man down here paying for blowjobs instead of saving up for my kids' college funds or taking my wife out on a date. Let's not let this get ugly. Uh, because this was sadly not an uncommon response, police do not elevate him on a list of suspects. October 13th, 1998, the body of 34-year-old Connie LaFontaine Ellis, found in Pierce County, Washington, dates National Guard duties, taking him back to the western side of the state. Witness Bruce Cheshire finds a female body near the 1700 block of 108th Street uh, South in Tacoma. No purse, wallet, no money found again, you know, just like the other victims. Again, the killer used a vehicle to transport the victim to the scene. Uh, again, has three plastic bags on her head, one gunshot wound to the head. Autopsy takes place on October 14th. Victim, of course, died to the gunshot of the gunshot wound or from the gunshot wound to the head. Connie was a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, grew up on a reservation in North Dakota, moved to Spokane at the age of 18, uh, described as a lovely young girl who attended beauty school, earned her license to cut and treat hair March 3rd, 1997, Trying to kick a drug habit at the time, been using heroin since 1992, in and out of rehab. She got over to the west side of the state, living in Tacoma, got married, had a child. Last time her family saw her was 1996 when her son died of a heart condition. And this is so sad. Then her second child dies of SIDS and she is devastated. She is emotionally destroyed by these deaths. Her father said, I don't think Connie cared too much about life, you know, after that. Yeah, that's uh, obviously super tragic. Connie stopped calling her family, turned to drugs to cope with her pain. So sad. And despite the tragic deaths of two of her children, uh, she had not, though, given up on life before Bob found her. Connie had entered a methadone treatment program September 8th, 1998, just a week before, it seems, uh, Bob killed her. She was last seen alive September 17th after receiving a dose of methadone uh, at a clinic. Spokane County learned of Connie's case the same day her body was found. A Spokane detective asked a Pierce County detective, will you just tell me one thing? Does she have plastic bags on her head? Now the task force knows that the same killer is active, both Western and Eastern Washington. Around this time, many items of evidence from various various recent murders I've listed are submitted to a crime lab. Projectiles, casings, hairs, fibers, swabs, firearm evidence examined by Washington State Patrol Crime Lab uh, scientist Ed Robinson. Robinson looked at the evidence uh, from the Johnson, Wasson, uh, McClanahan, Oster, or Oster, Mabin, Ellis cases. You know, each victim shot with a 25 caliber weapon. Just a few weeks later, November 10th, 1998, Robert Yates pulled over at the corner of First and Crest Line in Spokane in a 1985 Honda Civic. Two blocks off a of Zips drive-in on East Sprague Avenue. He's in that same area again. Oh man, Zips, local greasy burger chain. Used to love them. Now they hurt too much. Uh, still think about their milkshake sometimes. I got a milkshake from this Zips, from this uh, exact location before my first tattoo back in 2000. Uh, didn't know how much it hurt. And I thought a uh, chocolate milkshake. Uh, would be a nice distraction because I'm a child. Anything to rationalize a milkshake. Uh, the officer made the stop at 1.25 a.m. in the morning, accused him of picking up a prostitute, but Yates insists, no, I'm not. I, I'm picking up a woman to help her because her dad wanted me to go get her. <laughs> what? You think I picked up this sex worker at 1.30 in the morning on Tuesday night to have sex with her? No way. Not this family guy. I'm a friend of her dad's. He wondered where she was, and I was like, oh, I know. <laughs> Do I ever? I can't tell you how many working girls I've seen down here, including your daughter. Women I have picked up and sometimes killed. (laughs) What? Who said that? Come on. Just joshing around. Uh, He's released. The officer makes a note of the contact. Uh, Dude doesn't seem too worried about being caught, right? 
keeps going back to the exact same neighborhood. This is a small neighborhood. The stretch of East Spokane, not very big, keeps going back to pick up sex workers. November 12th, 1998, Amber Yates, Yates' middle daughter, calls the police and reports that her dad hits me all the time. Yates is charged with misdemeanor assault. Some cracks are finally starting to publicly show in the life of this so-called uh, family man, this family guy. Amber will later speak about this experience in a documentary interview. She said that Robert was helping her sister, Michelle, with some homework. Michelle didn't understand the problems, so he starts calling her stupid. She starts crying. Uh, Amber tells her dad to shut up, and he doesn't care for that. Grabs her, throws her on the floor, smacks her around. What the fuck is wrong with some people? Amber tries to defend herself, but Robert is so much bigger, right? So much stronger. She manages, though, to get off the ground, run to the phone. He pulls it out of the socket. She then flees from the house, uh, calls a friend, drives her to the police station. Amber there tells an officer what happened, and the officer goes to the house. So good for her. Love it. Hail Nimrod. Hail Amber. Takes a lot of courage to call the police on your own father, especially when when he's a scary piece of shit. Uh, Robert is charged, but not arrested and not taken to the station. December 1998. Yates goes back to work. Gets hired to be a strike breaker. Eek. At Kaiser Mead, local aluminum plant that used to employ hundreds of people. Uh, Yates worked as a carbon setter and crane operator and apparently got along well with his coworkers. Right? They considered him to be a, a big family guy because that's what he told him all the time. He likes to talk about his kids. Guessing he left out the recent assault charge on his daughter. Probably didn't talk too much about his sex worker addiction or murders or necrophilia. Hey, you guys want to go sledding this weekend? Oh, man, there's some great spots up on the South Hill near the house. Now, you bring the toboggans and the kids. Now, I'll, I'll bring the hot chocolate. And if we get bored, we can ditch the wives and kids and hop in my fuck van. And we can go pay for some sex and maybe kill some people. I don't know. Uh, he took on a leadership fatherly role to the younger men he worked with. Back at home, this uh, family guy's family, not too happy with him. His wife, Linda, more upset than she usually is. I feel like this is substantial because I'm sure her baseline is, you know, fuck this guy, I hope he dies. But now she's more upset. Uh, Money has gotten particularly tight. She doesn't understand why. She's gone over the recent bank statements and uh, seen uh, frequent ATM cash withdrawals. When she brings them up to Bob, he tells her to get a job if she wants more money, as a good family man does. He's trying his best. A man's got to eat. man's got to come in other women's vaginas sometimes. Come on. Every family guy knows that. Adding more stress to the relationship, Junior uh, becoming especially sexually frustrated. After his last run with the police, he took a break from hiring and sometimes killing sex workers, and that's fucking up his libido. And now he's experiencing impotence. You know, he had tried talking to his wife, Linda, about maybe doing some role playing, you know, but she's too much of a prude. He was just like, maybe just every once in a while. Why can't, you know, you just let me shoot you in the head with a 25, put a plastic bag over your head to stop the bleeding, and then fuck you when you're dead. And she's like, what did you just say? And he's like, what? I, I didn't say anything. You said something. And then he pointed behind her. And he's like, oh, cool. Ch- check out that neat bird I'm looking at. And then when she turned to look at it, there was no bird. And, but then when she turned back around, he was already walking away like they weren't even talking. Smooth criminal. Uh, what he really talked to his wife about was buying Vi- Viagra. Uh, she said he didn't need it. That they were both just tired. Yeah, I bet she said they didn't need it. Imagine she was uh, <laughs> very tired of fucking this creep. Some Viagra probably sounded like torture. Have that weirdo try and fuck her even more? No, thank you. In addition to all the ATM withdrawals, uh, Linda also found on a credit card statement a bunch of charges for renting a room at Al Spa Tub Motel. I cannot believe this place showed up. This is a place I joked about so much when I was going to Gonzaga. Can't believe it actually showed up in a suck. Yeah, he told her he was uh, just using their hot tubs to relax his muscles after work. She suspects he's having an affair. Uh, suspected she, she had to have known at least that was going on. Al Spa Tub Motel. This place was fucking insane. It was located about two blocks from Gonzaga's campus on North Division, finally closed, torn down in 2020. Uh, we used to joke about this place all the time. It was referenced in sketches we put on and that waiting on, waiting on FM show. This place was the motel you would reference if you were joking about paying for sex. If you wanted to reference a sleazy motel, bing, 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 this is number one in all of Spokane. Uh, closed down during the pandemic. Uh, you know, yeah, finally. Finally, yeah, uh, torn down. I already said that. But uh, be- before that, though, landmarks sitting on one of the busiest streets in Spokane, right? Just just right next to campus. Main advertising points were being able to rent rooms by the hour. Uh, and those rooms having, quote, adult cable TV. So porn uh, before the internet made it available for everyone. And, and they had hot tubs in every room. O- only an idiot would rent a room here thinking it was just a good place to stay for the night. Like if you, if you brought your family to stay here, you should probably have your kids taken from you. This was a motel exclusively geared towards sex work. Linda suspected Bob was having an affair. Yeah, 
Uh huh. I I would hope I would hope so. And this sometimes comes some comes across as such a sad character in the story. Right? No wonder she stayed away from reporters and journalists since Bob's first trial ended. She doesn't often uh, look great in these uh, these little moments. Uh, January 1999, Yates informed that his misdemeanor charge for assaulting his daughter would be dropped if he had no more trouble for the next two years. When he is told that, he asks, but what about all those women I've been killing? And they're like, what? And then he was like, huh? I didn't say anything. And then he was like, oh, whoa, that's a neat bird. And he points behind him. They turn around. They don't see anything. But then when they turn back around, uh, you know, he says to him, your flies down. And then one of them looks, he fucking runs his fingers up the guy's chest real quick, kind of bops him on the nose. And he's like, made you look, you know? And then when they start to say like, don't put your hands on me. He interrupts. He's like, squirrel. And he fucking smacks him with the back of his hand on their nuts. Gotcha. And they're so fucking annoyed. They forgot all about the first thing he said. And they're just like, get out of here. Or none of that happens. Or he's talked uh, to about his daughter, you know, and that's it. March of 1999, Yates applies to fly helicopters for an air ambulance service in Spokane. Thank God there are no openings. How weird might that have been if he would have gotten that like a life flight job? I imagine him trying to kill some lady on his way to work. You know, he's going to work for a graveyard shift. Uh, She barely survives. Then a witness finds her. She needs to be life flighted. He ends up having to fly her, right? Someone he's just shot to the hospital. Bob, what are you doing? The the hospital is the the other direction. No, I, I know. I just, um, there could be turbulence. I just felt like there might be some turbulence up ahead. We, we should be safe. And uh, I got to swing by the house and grab something. Uh, early June, 1999. I graduate with a bachelor's in psychology, uh, minor in English literature from Gonzaga. Uh, go to work for Crisis Residential Treatment Center. I know that's nothing to do with Bob, but I've woven my campus life in this tale. Thought I should mention it. I run an apartment with a buddy in the Logan neighborhood. September 15th, 1999, Yates meets with some detectives at Spokane Public Safety Building for an interview about murdered sex workers. Fucking finally. He's told that his name has come up during the investigation, but that he's not a primary suspect. And he, that's kind of true. He's not really. Uh, he was free to refuse to answer any questions or leave. Yates didn't know that the police had narrowed down thousands of plates to just a list of 34 individuals whose names had shown up multiple times in police reports. So he's in the top 40 now of guys the police are looking at. An officer asked him about the time he was pulled over in 1998. Yates gave the same story, right? The girl's dad, he wanted him, he wanted him to pick her up. He worked with her dad and, you know, and, and, his, and her dad was like, can you just get my daughter and bring her home? Uh, he couldn't remember the woman's name though, or the dad's name. Detectives warned him that uh, the story doesn't sound really great. Uh, seems like you're lying, but he sticks with the story. Then he really fucks up uh, again. Uh, he says, uh, they asked him what he was doing a previous time. He was in East Sprague. Uh, when he got pulled over driving a white Camaro and he corrects them. He's like, oh no, that wasn't a white Camaro. It was a white Corvette. Remember back in 1997, Heather Hernandez's friend, uh, Yolanda Carey, said the last time she saw Heather alive was when she climbed into a white Corvette with a middle-aged white man. Then the Texas began compiling a list of white Corvette owners in Eastern Washington, then cross-referenced that with people who had been stopped by police in the area, frequented by sex workers, identified in field reports. Yates' name had come up. Now he's reminding them of that. He's jumping now from top 40 to what? Top five, top three, maybe number one. When asked if he still owned the white Corvette, he said he had sold it. Now he's asked to give a blood sample. Uh, the killer left forensic evidence in multiple crime sites. Yates says he'll have to think about it. So he's obviously looking real bad right now. One detective uh, notes that Yates seems extremely nervous and is sweating profusely during the interview. Uh, September 16th, 1999, detectives tracked down the woman Yates picked up on November 10th, 1998. Her name is Jennifer Robinson. The woman, uh, he said he picked up because her dad wanted him to go find her. She, of course, tells a different story. She says Yates agreed to pay her 20 bucks to perform a sex act. Uh, and then when he was uh, pulled over, he made up the story about her dad. Uh, her father did not work with Yates. Yates gave the police a false address as well for her father's house. Uh, September 18th, 1999. Yates calls the Spokane police, informs them that he will not be giving them a blood sample. They figure he must be innocent and they drop him from their suspect list. Or he looks guilty as fuck and he's now the prime suspect. January 7th, 2000, detectives tracked down Rita Jones, owner of that Yates is, uh, of his former white Corvette. Yates owned the vehicle from September 8th, 1994 to May 7th, 1998. She confirmed Yates sold it to her for uh, just under 9,000. Uh, Rita had parked the car in her sister's garage, a sister who just happened to work for the Spokane Police Department. Fuck yeah, nice. Uh, Rita immediately allows the police to collect fiber samples from her car. And the state crime lab learns the carpet has been changed twice in two years. Yates told Rita it only been changed once. He's looking more and more suspicious. But so far, they just don't have enough uh, to go force him to give them a blood sample or charge him with anything. Uh, around this time, I get a, I get a, a part-time job on top of my full-time job at the Crisis Residential Center 
at a 24-hour fitness, working as a personal trainer just a few blocks from where Bob lived. Uh, back, when I, back when I was ripped for a brief, brief period. Back when I could drink so much beer and not have consequences. Uh, March 22, 2000, a detective found a list of license plates kept by Joe Lockridge, boyfriend of sex worker Cheryl Sickerman. Smart. Uh, Joe wrote down the license plates of cars that picked up his sex worker girlfriend. So, you know, she could let them know that he did that and that he would report them if anything happened to her. Cheryl dated the driver of uh, license plate 507 JKN to March 7th, 2000. The license plate belonged to a 1985 Honda Accord registered to Robert Yates. More evidence that Yates is a frequent client of the women working East Bray, not just some dude picking up these ladies uh, to help their dads out. April 5th, 2000, Kevin Jenkins, forensic scientist from the state crime lab, informs detectives on the task force that the fibers from the Corvette very closely match those found on 1997 murder victim Jennifer Joseph's body, her shoes, and the towel. Jones told his colleagues, in the world of fibers, two fibers don't match any better than these two. So cool that detectives can do that kind of analysis, or that their labs can, you know. Task Force detectives now called Spokane County uh, Sheriff Mark Sturk. Sturk was with Sheriff Mike Humphreys of Walla Walla. Sturk told Humphreys that he thought the Spokane killer was a man who'd killed years earlier in Walla Walla. Humphreys had a detective find that old Oliver Savage file. Those young best friends, possible budding lovers, shot to death while picnicking. Sturk learned that Yates lived and worked in Walla Walla in 1975 and that he'd purchased a Ruger 357 from Payless Drug on April 25th, 1974, purchased ammo in 1975, uh, the kind of ammo used to kill the pair, purchased shortly before killing them, July 3rd. Uh, check proved that Yates worked at the state penitentiary for a short time, starting in July. Uh, Humphreys contacted William Brewer, Yates' father-in-law. Brewer confirmed that Yates worked at the prison and owned several guns. Wonder what old Billy Brewer thought of Bobby Bobbert before he was arrested. He had to have hated him, right? Especially after roughing up his granddaughter. I'd hate this motherfucker if he was married to my daughter. Uh, records show that Yates sold the 357 to Kesserling Sporting Goods in Oak Harbor, Washington. Larry Johnson purchased the gun, sold it in 1977 or 78 to a private party. Manufacturer provided the police with a serial number. Detective is able to recover this gun, impressive, but can't conclusively conclude with 100% certainty that it's the murder weapon in the Oliver and Savage murders. Damn it. Still, not enough evidence that they need to charge Bobbert and have it stick. But of course, you know, they are mounting more and more evidence. Keeps looking guiltier and guiltier. April 7th, 2000, Task Force tows Bob's old Corvette to their vehicle processing station. They're able to execute a search warrant. April 10th, they find old dried blood on the passenger side seat belt buckle, uh, driver's seat, and on the passenger seat. Under the passenger side floorboard, they also find a small white button. Exactly like one of the missing buttons from Jennifer Joseph's blouse because it was the missing button. That, that fucking button comes back to help lead to murder charges against Bob. Love that they found after Bob sold the Corvette. Love that little detail, right? Helping this case. Well done, SPD. Gotta give detectives big props on this. Task Force collects Jennifer's parents' DNA, compares it to the bloodstains. Forensic scientists find an extremely high likelihood that the DNA is from a child of Joseph's parents. So it's all looking bad for Yates. They're closing it. April 15, 2000, Yates tells his wife, Linda, he's going to Tacoma to return some military clothing to Fort Lewis. But really, he goes to Al's Spa Tub Motel. Fucking classy. To meet a sex worker. Linda then questions him about the bank statements again. There's a $600 difference between her check register and her most recent statement. Yates now breaks down, starts crying, confesses, Linda, I have a problem. You need to help me. He says he'd recently gone on a fully paid flight training trip, but he spent an additional $2,100. Uh, he'd originally told Linda he used that money to buy gifts for her and the kids. Now he says the quote unquote truth is that he spent it gambling. And by gambling, of course, he means gambling with his dick on sex workers. Plain, who am I going to come in roulette? Linda later says, uh, he boohooed. I walked out. I knew then he'd lost his grip. I sensed that something terrible was about to happen. Oh, so many terrible things have already happened, Linda. Uh, April 16th, 2000, detectives began 24-7 surveillance on Robert Yates' house while they prepared to arrest him. Yates had just returned from a two-week training with the National Guard. April 18th, 2000, 47-year-old Robert Yates is arrested for the murder of 16-year-old Jennifer Joseph. Almost. When detectives first approach him, thinking fast, he points behind him. He yells, oh, wow, I didn't think crows could get that big. That's really neat. And after the officers turn around, don't see any neat-looking crow, uh, crows, they turn back around. He is a good two blocks away running at full sprint. He was very fast. And I know this gag is so stupid. But the absurdity of a killer not getting caught because he just like points behind people and tells him he's seen a neat kind of bird is very funny to me because I'm an idiot. Uh, in reality, of course, he's arrested. He's arrested early at 6.30 a.m. just as he leaves his house for work. 
Two detectives follow him until he is driven out of view from the house to spare his family embarrassment. Detectives Rick Gravenstein, Dave Bentley, who've been working the case now for years, make the arrest. Gravenstein said, I told him that he was under arrest for the murder of 16-year-old Jennifer Joseph, and the man didn't seem the least bit concerned. Yates is booked into jail on suspicion of murder, 9.41 a.m. Through DNA analysis, the task force able to now, uh, able now to get a blood sample, uh, they quickly match Yates to many more victims. Dan Steins from Pathology Associates obtains Yates' blood, and the blood is sent to the WSP Crime Lab to compare with semen swabs and, and that condom they found. Uh, 4.45 p.m. Uh, forensic, or a condom they found. Uh, 4.45 p.m. forensic scientist Bill Kulnane advises investigators that Yates' blood is a DNA direct match for semen found on the bodies of Scott, Johnson, Wasson, McClenahan, Mercer, Oster, Mabin, and Durning, eight additional victims. Yates' image now published in the Spokesman Review. Right, Numerous sex workers contact the paper, contact the police, uh, let them know they've dated Yates. You know, they say he's picked them up, driven them to other locations for sex acts. He always pays first. This indicates to police that Yates killed, then robbed his victims since none of them had money on them when they were found. The police now spend a few days searching the interior and exterior of Yates' house. They find Shannon Zielinski's blood on a coat in the home. Uh, Ten victims linked directly to him now. They find a Mickey Mouse coat belonging to missing Melody Murfin. Linda said that Robert brought her the coat one night. In her words, it smelled like a, quote, French whorehouse. And she had to wash it a few times before she could wear it. Jesus. Yates' family was just as shocked as the public when they uh, received news of the arrest. At least they said they were. Again, I think on some level, some of them had to have known, right? But maybe not, I guess. I don't know. Linda received a call from Kaiser Lunum informing her that Bobby didn't show up to work. She suspected he was at the motel again, drove to the address in the credit card statement. Bobby wasn't there. So Linda went to Burger King for a coffee. Police approached her as she got out of her car. And Linda said, if this is about Bob, I'm going to kill him. She now learned he'd been arrested for murder. Linda now explains the 1945 murder to police. I don't know why that was, oh, this, this is why he did it. He's got murder in his blood. That one when Bob's, you know, grandma killed his grandpa. And then she asked if she could uh, still have her coffee. You know, finding out your husband has been arrested for murder, no reason not to enjoy some delicious Burger King coffee. At the police station, Linda's informed that her husband may be the Spokane serial killer. Man, I hope after that news, she was able to enjoy some French fries, maybe a milkshake. All right? I feel like you need more than a cup of Burger King coffee to wash down that news with. Took the police just a few minutes to realize Linda didn't know anything. I don't think Linda wanted to know anything. Linda didn't seem to be real active in her own life in some ways. Seemed to prefer denial to facing the fact that her husband and father of her kids was a huge piece of shit. Uh, Linda called her daughter Amber, who was at work. Michelle was at school, uh, called into the office. Amber Yates later said, when the detectives told us about the crime, I immediately started crying. It was devastating, disappointing. It was shocking for all of us, all my siblings. It still is a struggle for us today. Melissa Yates uh, later said, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And especially after I saw him on the news, after they arrested him, it felt like it was someone else. But you know, that's my dad. How could he do that? The family now wasn't allowed to go home. The sheriff's office paid for them to stay in a hotel for days while the house was searched for evidence. Yates' youngest son had to leave the room uh, anytime the case would come on the news. Poor little guy, 11 years old. Amber Yates uh, went to visit her father in jail, asked him about the crime. She said he only hit Jennifer Joseph. He didn't admit to killing her. Holy shit. What a, what a nightmare all of this would be. Imagine if this is your dad. What, what kind of havoc that would wreak on your family, right? And, he's, and he does admit to doing some super creepy shit, you know? Amber, yes. So, okay, listen. No, I didn't kill her. I smacked around a girl your exact age that I was paying to have sex with. Listen, being a grown up is hard. I'm sure you're mad at me. But, but, but wait until you have kids. Wait until you're smacking around some kid your kid's age that you're fucking. We'll see how high and mighty you are then. Uh, could you still have a relationship with your dad after he told you something like that? I don't think I could, right? I, I think I would have to say goodbye forever. When my dad gets caught. No. Uh, <laughs> easy, to, easy to say when you're faced, uh, not personally faced with that choice, so I know. But Yates' family will make that choice. They do uh, not have any contact with him from what I understand. So good for them. Uh, Yates' extended family and friends and current and former co-workers are initially shocked. Many of them, you know, uh, refuse to believe he's the killer, ask for judgments to be reserved until more evidence comes out. Pretty normal. Uh, won't take them long, though, to realize he for sure did it. This case moves along pretty damn fast now. April 19th, 2000. The day after being arrested, Yates is officially charged with the murder of Jennifer Joseph. Spokane County Sheriff Mark Sterk announces he's a suspect in eight other murders. Uh, he's actually suspected in more than those murders, but those were the ones they had the most evidence for at the time. April 20th, 2000, Richard Old, Professor Elderly Cock is back, baby! 
Uh, he goes to the Yates residence to examine the plants around the house, finds a strong probability that the plant material found with the victims originated in that yard, right? Further implicating Yates with these murders. April 25th, 2000, seven days after Bobbert's arrest, latent print matched to Bob. Uh, this print first developed on March 9th, 1998 from a plastic bag found on Sean McClanahan's body. Uh, and now German investigators announced they're investigating Yates for 26 unsolved murders that occurred while he was overseas. He'll never be charged with any of those murders, but criminal behavior experts who have weighed in on Yates' case seem to all agree that it is very unlikely that he didn't kill when he was over in Germany and just out of the country in general. Uh, May 9th and 10th, 2000, three weeks after Junior's arrest, Spokane police locate and search Bob's Black Fort van. Records confirmed Yates owned the van until May 7th, 1999, and then it was listed as an insurance total loss. Uh, it was not. They find bloodstains, 25 caliber bullet casing, even uh, find a bullet stuck in the roof of the van. Looks a little bit bad for him. Uh, Christine Smith now contacts the police after recognizing Yates' mugshot in the spokesman review. She informs the police that he was the man who assaulted her, August 1st, 98. She had just learned that he didn't just hit her in the head, he had shot her. Uh, she found that out just a few months earlier in March when she was given an x-ray after a car accident and they found bullet fragments in her fucking face and skull. God, uh, Christine had fragments, um, you know, removed for ballistic comparison. It was determined that the fragments came from a 25 caliber weapon. Christine meets with the police on May 12th, identifies Yates in a photo lineup. Walls are closing in quick. May 18th, 2000, a month after his arrest, Spokane County now files two charges against Yates in an affidavit, right? The details of the investigation. Count one, premeditated murder in the first degree with aggravating circumstances committed as follows. Between August 16th, 97 and August 26, 97, with premeditated intent to cause the death of Jennifer A. Joseph and the murder of Jennifer A. Joseph, part of a common scheme or plan involving more than one victim, to wit, and then lists out uh, many other names. Case two, premeditated murder in the first degree with aggravating circumstances, committed as follows. Between October 1, 97, November 5, 97, with premeditated intent to cause the death of another person, did cause the death of Darla C. Scott. May 31st, 2000, six weeks after his arrest, Yates pleads now not guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder. Uh, another month later, June 30th, Yates' attorney, Richard Fazy, writes a letter to the prosecutor asking for a plea deal, right? Dick Fazy knows he can't defend this piece of shit. Too much evidence. The deal is this. Yates is going to confess not just to eight murders, but to 15. He'll confess to 10 murders in Spokane, two murders in Pierce County, two more in Walla Walla, and one in Skagit County. And he'll confess to the attempted murder of Christine Smith. He'll answer any questions, tell the police what he did with the guns, and draw a map to the missing Melody Murphin's, uh, missing body of Melody Murphin. In return, he just won't receive the death penalty, and he won't have to discuss any of the crimes. They accept. October 13, 2008, pleads guilty to everything I just laid out, 15 murders, one attempted murder. A judge sentenced him to 408 years in prison. Spokane prosecutors reserve a 16th murder that they know Bob committed that he wouldn't confess to, Sean McClanahan's murder, uh, to file against him in case he appeals later which will make him eligible to receive the death penalty. So that's smart, right? Keeping a little ace in their sleeve. Even though Yates doesn't have to discuss his crimes, his victims, family members do get to read statements to him in court. Chris Oliver, Patrick Oliver's brother says, you could postpone your ultimate judgment. You can't avoid that day. Heather Smith, Shannon Zielinski's daughter says, God will not forgive you, Mr. Yates. You killed my mom. Sean Johnson's sister uh, says, some of the victims were younger than your daughter's. Had she taken the wrong road in life, would you have killed her too? You know, referring to one daughter. Sonny Otter's father says, useless garbage. Those two words come pretty close to describing your existence. Yeah, uh, yep, pretty uh, pretty fair. Uh, many more also speak. Sashi Yates also speaks in court. I'm the eldest daughter of Robert Yates. I feel immensely terrible that this has happened. It feels like a dream. I'm still in shock. They didn't deserve this. No one deserves to be killed like that. No one. I also, like most of the victims, want to know why. What caused this? I still love you, Dad. Even though you did this, I may not understand why. I may never find out why the reason behind this. Finally, Yates reads his own statement in court. He says, nothing I can say will erase the sorrow, the pain, and the anguish that you feel that I've caused in your lives. I've caused much sorrow, much pain. You can't know how much pain I know I've caused for all of you and my family. I've taken away the love, the compassion, and the tenderness of your loved ones. And I've submitted in that place of grief and bitterness. Uh, I pray that God will right the wrongs that I've committed, that justice will bring closure to all who, as a result of my actions, have become victims. I pray. And I apologize to the public, this community, this nation, to law enforcement, to my family, my lovely wife, my children whom I dearly love, my friends and my family, 
Most of all, to the families and friends of Su- Susan Savage, I'm sorry. And then he repeats that phrase, you know, most of all, to the families and friends of, you know, and he searched each, each victim's name followed by, I'm sorry, over and over. And then after reading the last victim's name, he says, uh, hey, how did a bald eagle get in here? And he points to the back of the courtroom. When everyone tries to find the bald eagle, he sneaks out, has never been seen again. Smooth criminal. Of course not. Now, after these statements are read uh, as part of his plea deal, Yates draws a map to missing Melody Murphy's body and detectives are shocked by a simple drawing just depicts a house. And he tells them that Melody is buried in his yard. Mm-hmm. October 18th, 2000, Melody Murphy's remains found buried in the side yard of Robert Yates' house, buried 34 inches deep in a small garden right beneath his bedroom window, just a few feet away from his wife slept, where his wife slept. She had three plastic bags around her head. Why did he bury one victim right next to his bedroom? Did he find her to be the most attractive, right? This has to be sexual. Uh, when he had sex with his wife, did knowing one of his victim's bodies is buried just a few feet away. Did that cure his impotence? It's fucking cre- extra creepy. 2001, Yates is charged in Pierce County for murdering two additional victims, Melinda Mercer, Connie Ellis. Pierce County prosecutors uh, had refused to sign the Spokane plea deal. Old Bobber got tricked. M- maybe they pulled the running gag I made up on him, right? You guys aren't going to try me for murder again, are you? Of course not, Bob. Uh, we just, uh, we're just we going to sign right here. Uh, we'll let you see it. We're going to sign right here. You don't have to worry about, hey, is that a pink flamingo? And then he looks where they point. And then when, they, when he looks back around, if not seeing the flamingo, they've thrown the papers in the briefcase without signing them, right? I, I don't see any pink flamingo. Yeah, yeah, I flew off real quick. But anyway, they're, they're so fast. Have a good day. Definitely not going to try you for capital punishment. Uh, Pierce County charges Yates with aggravated first degree murder, the only crime in Washington at that time that came with uh, capital punishment. Robert Yates' Pierce County trial begins August 12, 2002. It'll end exactly a month later, September 12th. Uh, Yates' defense will conclude that he did not, that he, or sorry, that he did kill the women, but the crimes did not meet the criteria for aggravated first degree murder. Prosecutors argued that the killings did meet the criteria for capital punishment, right? Two or more victims in a common scheme. Also, it's during his trial here that his necrophilia stuff comes up. Uh, the defense tries to use it in some kind of pseudo insanity type bullshit defense. You know, he, he, he didn't want to kill anyone. He just really needed to fuck someone who had just died and the murders would just kind of happen as a a means to that end. It wasn't a good defense and it didn't work. September 19th, 2002, Robert Yates found guilty of two counts of aggregated uh, first degree murder. Jury deliberated less than two days, found him guilty of three aggravating factors. He robbed his victims, tried to conceal the crimes and the murders were part of the common scheme. September 24, 2002, the sentencing phase of the trial began. Parents, uh, family of the victims testified for the prosecution. Yates' family testified for the defense. Those poor bastards. At that point, just let him fucking rot. Uh, October 3rd, 2002, a jury sentences Robert Lee Yates to death. October 9th, he is, uh, his death uh, sentence is confirmed by a judge. And off to death row he goes. And where would he sit on death row? Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. Back where this all began. Full circle. Back where he used to work. How strange. First time we've come across a detail like that in one of these cases. I wonder if anyone working with him there back in 1975 was still there in 2002. Or if any inmate was still there who had been incarcerated since 1975. I mean, probably not. That's a, that's a long time. But maybe. H- how great if you're in there and then the guard that you fucking hate gets put in there with you. What's up, buddy? Oh, man. Get ready for a rough ride in here. I'll see you in the showers. Bunch of us will. Uh, sadly, Yates will not be put to death on October 12, 2018. Washington State abolishes capital punishment, stating that the law is applied arbitrarily and in a racially biased manner, which it has been obviously historically many times. Uh, all death row inmates, including Robert Yates, have their sentences commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And for Robert, that's a bummer. Uh, I hate that his life can still have meaning. I really do. You know, maybe, maybe he's becoming a mentor to younger prisoners now. Maybe he's running some kind of club. Maybe, maybe he started a birdwatching group. You know, he's, he's, he, ha- he has made it clear that he's a committed Christian again. He's been, uh, you know, vocal about that a few times. So that's, that's cool. Uh, he's asked Jesus for forgiveness and given his heart and soul to Christ. So he gets to go to heaven. How awesome for him. And because some of his uh, victims, some of those women probably did not give their souls to Christ before he shot them in the head unexpectedly, they have to burn in hell forever and ever. So that's perfect. What a wonderful and wise and benevolent system for salvation. Praise God. Have fun in heaven, Bob. Uh, I'll say hi to your victims when I'm down burning in hell. It is crazy to me that so many people interpret the Bible in this way. How can anyone actually believe a perfect, omnipotent, and loving creator would fucking reward Bob Yates and punish his victims? 
Uh, oh yeah, because many of us are not rational at all. That's fine. Uh, fuck you, Bob. If anyone is burning, you are. Let's get out of here. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Before I share my recap, uh, longtime Suck First character, Chicken Joe, former pimp, resident sex worker, expert here uh, at Time Suck, uh, would like to share a few words with you. Bok, bok, playboy. Bok, bok. Yo, yo, yo. This is Chicken Joe. Bob, Bob, Bob. Why you gotta add so much pain to an already hard job? Girls give what you can't get at home. In exchange for some loving, you give them shots to the dome. Killing a girl younger than your own daughter? You a cold-blooded killer and a monster of a father. Dan could wonder all day about exactly why you did it, but I know the truth. Killing was just a favorite way you like to hit it. Nothing got your blood moving like blood leaving someone else, and that makes killing an easy choice when you're a man who thinks only of himself. Plain old selfishness. That's how you become the devil's plaything. You feel me? You dig? You hear what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Chicken Joe. That was, um, that was very well stated. Uh, Robert Lee Yates, what a piece of shit. Why did he do it? Why did he destroy at least 16 lives? Well, I think Chicken Joe's done there pretty well, but, uh, you know, we'll probably never know for sure. He won't talk about it. Maybe he's afraid if he does, he'll slip up, mention some other people he's killed, end up getting sent overseas, maybe to Germany for some more trials. In addition to all the women he's killed, uh, he also did so much damage to his own family, right? His arrest was financially devastating for Linda and the kids, didn't even talk about that. She filed a bankruptcy petition under Chapter 7 of the Bankruptcy Code. Uh, the petition claimed that her assets only equaled $136,000 against liabilities of $475,000. Part of that money ended up being owed to Christine Smith, the only Yates victim known to have ever survived. The woman who didn't realize she'd been shot for a couple months, she sued him and won. The couple's two-story house in Spokane, South Hill was her biggest asset, but only valued at $113,000. Linda and the family have uh, lived quiet lives, unsurprisingly, since Robert's arrest, so we don't know exactly what has happened to them. I'm guessing they lost everything. I'm guessing Linda had to start over with nothing in her mid to late 40s. Said one source that she and the kids went into hiding with nothing but the clothes on their backs. And all of this was done for what? To fulfill Yates' deviant sexual impulses. Once again, fucking amazing. What some people will do just to come how they want to come. Uh, why not try therapy first? There's therapists that deal with this stuff. Uh, see if some uh, therapy can get you to a place where you can, I don't know, have an orgasm that doesn't involve maybe shooting women in the head. Some people are just fucking dumb, selfish animals. Uh, I hope Bob dies horribly in prison soon. I hate that he still gets to smile and laugh and feel good about himself or maybe helping a guard or giving advice to a fellow inmate, whatever. Before he was caught, a group of three of my friends uh, actually thought they had met him. I can't remember exactly when this was. Sometime in 1998, I think. When the Spokane serial killer was in the in the papers a lot, at one point, a sketch was released of what the killer might look like in the spokesman review. Turned out to be the wrong guy, but we didn't know that. And my friends had partied with a guy who looked like the guy in the sketch at a seedy bar we sometimes went to in the Logan neighborhood called The Chef. Now in that location, it's called The Star, right in the corner of uh, Mission and Hamilton. We were weirdos, loved to hang out with weird people, but this guy creeped my uh, creepy friends out. Uh, they said he told them shit in all seriousness like, uh, uh, here, here's a good pickup line. Hey, baby, I lick. Uh, we all wondered if the I lick dude was the serial killer up until Yates arrest. Turned out he wasn't that obviously, uh, or wasn't, you know, that same creep. Obviously a creep, not the same creep. Oh man. Uh, he was actually so much, uh, you know, uh, sneakier than the guy who'd probably hang out with college kids and say something like that. Robert Yates was the stereotype of the serial killer, right? The guy who could be your neighbor. A guy who, you know, keeps his lawn mode and maybe your kids play with his kids. A guy who seems like such a good family guy who at night, just a few miles from his house, is putting bullets in the heads of other families, mothers, sisters, daughters, then having sex with their corpses. And maybe watching one of his daughter's basketball or volleyball games the next day. Fucking crazy. Bob grew up in the beautiful island town of Oak Harbor, Washington. His childhood didn't seem to indicate that any of this was coming. Not that it always does. Not that it even often does. But he was the only child of a normal middle-class family, did well in school, enjoyed the outdoors, played sports, didn't have an abusive family, didn't suffer some severe mental illness, didn't suffer severe head trauma that fucked up his frontal lobe. But for some reason, he wanted to kill. It turned him on. And to feel sexually fulfilled, he caused an unfathomable amount of pain for his victims and his families. People who had done nothing to him. Uh, he left his wife and five kids, you know, to live with the stigma and shame that comes with being related to a serial killer. 
And he still lives and breathes today at the age of 69 in Walla Walla, Washington. Right? Again, back where all this bullshit began. Let's recap this monster. Also learn something new in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Robert Yates escaped the police's notice a few times, largely due to him seeming to be such a perfectly average family guy. White, medium build, brown hair, normal face, quiet, always blending in, never failing at anything, never really exceeding beyond his peers either. Coworkers liked him, wasn't the best at his job, but didn't suck either. His fellow army members respected him, sex workers liked and trusted him, and uh, he used that trust to kill many of them. Number two, Despite a perfectly normal childhood, Yates did have a weird tragedy in his family history. 1945, his grandmother struck her husband four times in the head with an axe after becoming fed up with her marriage and his cheating. He died from his wounds. She spent seven years in a mental institution. No word on what happened to her after those seven years. Uh, Maybe she became a logger. Number three, critical mistake. May have allowed Bobby Yates to get away with murder long enough to claim several more victims. He was pulled over in September 1997 for failing to signal a lane change. An officer noted that his car matched the description of suspicious vehicles in the Jennifer Joseph case. Unfortunately, this officer wrote that he pulled uh, over a white Camaro, not a Corvette. If he'd written down the correct car, Yates might have been arrested much sooner. Number four, victim Melody Murphin missing uh, from May 1998 to October 2000. As part of his plea plea deal, Yates uh, agrees to reveal her location and it's his yard. He had buried her right beneath his bedroom window in his little garden. His wife and he just slept a few feet away from a dead body for around two years. His children probably played directly above her shallow grave. Also, forgot to mention, uh, he dug her shallow grave and buried her while his wife was sleeping in that bedroom, just a few feet away. Number five, new info. Amber and Melissa Yates, daughters of Robert Yates, participated in the show Monster in My Family, a show hosted by Melissa Moore, daughter of previous suck subject, the happy face killer, Her goal is to help families of serial killers connect with families' victims or victims' families, excuse me, and talk about their experiences. The Yates daughters spoke to Kathy Lloyd, Sean McClenahan's sister. All the women hugged upon meeting each other. Kathy showed them pictures of Sean and described what it was like waiting for her on Christmas Day. So sad. She read them the last letter Sean had ever sent her. Dear Kathy, I'm sorry you're receiving this late. I'm still using heroin daily, prostituting to pay for it. But the good news is a week from this coming Monday, I stop the heroin and go on methadone. God, I'm so happy, Kathy. This nightmare is almost over. I miss you all so very much. It hurts me to think of you all. I spend all this time alone wishing for better days. God, it looks like they are near. Please update my brothers and mother and tell them about my life. Tell them all. I love them and I'm still alive. God bless you all. I love you, Sean. Fuck. Opiates. All three women ended the documentary with final statements. Michelle said, I knew some of the other women were trying to better their lives and I felt like he just totally screwed it up. Well, yeah. They were trying to better themselves. They were trying to get out of what they were doing. Just right when that was happening, he had to kill them. And Kathy said, I want to take everybody's pain away. It'll never end. We're all victims. And Amber said, my dad definitely knew the difference between right and wrong. He told me one day when I was a teenager. Deep down, even though people say they don't know the difference between right and wrong, deep down inside, they do know what they're doing is wrong. And he was almost in tears when he said that to me. He knew what he was doing. Man, what a crazy hornet's nest. The inside of that guy's fucking head must be. Let's get away from it. Let's get out of here. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Robert Yates, serial killing family guy, has been sucked. I am glad I finally know a lot of the details about the, uh, the first, well, only serial killer that I know of that was active, you know, very, very near me at any point in my life. Uh, Yeah. Thanks to the uh, Bad Magic Productions team. Uh, thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to the Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley for production. Uh, thanks to Bitelixer for upkeep on the Time Suck app. Logan Art Warlock Keith, creating merch at bad ma- badmagicmerch.com. And for running the social with Lizzie and Chantrez Hernandez. Thanks to Olivia Lee for leading the initial research on this one. Um, it was a little, little tricky. Not a, not a lot of journalism done on old Bobby Yates. Maybe just because he didn't talk enough. I don't know. Maybe because some of the aspects of his crime just weren't weird enough. Maybe, I don't know, the location of Spokane wasn't titillated enough for this to get uh, more, not that I want to say recognition, that none of these guys should probably be that recognized, but just just odd that it didn't get the, the coverage a lot of killers have gotten. 
Uh, thanks to the All Seeing Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page and Beefsteak and his mod squad running Discord. Next week, uh, we're going to dive right back into true crime with a, with a different kind of case, very strange case. The Amish killer, Ed Gingerich, the space lizards have voted him in. Kind of take another look into the world of the Amish. Did you know that it took until 1994 for an Amish person to be convicted of murder? Uh, while we don't know how many Amish uh, people have committed murder, you know, it would be the murder of Katie Gingrich by her husband, Ed, that would claim the title of the first Amish murder and earn Ed the moniker of the Amish killer. On the night of Mar- March 18th, 1993, Ed Gingrich, who had been suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, who had stopped taking his medication, walked into his kitchen, knocked down his wife, Katie, who was preparing to go out to a wedding. And then while two of their three young kids looked on, well, shit got really, really, really brutal. Uh, the entire time, uh, he was murdering, he was ranting and raving about Satan, God, and salvation. How did this happen? How did a community known for being some of the most peaceful people on earth, at least ideologically, give birth to this monstrous crime? How did Ed's insanity progress without getting him the treatment he needed? And can you cure paranoid schizophrenia with toe pulling and uh, black strap molasses? Uh, the answer is no to the last questions, obviously, but for Ed Gingrich, uh, wouldn't uh, stop him from trying. Seriously. All of this insanity and more next week on Time Suck. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. First update, a very kind response to Sarah from Texas's, uh, uh, the update. Um, Sarah from Texas, sorry. For a very kind response to Sarah from Texas's update. Uh, read in the Raelianism Suck. Uh, kick-ass sack. Uh, Vince, reminder that there are great people in the world, writes, Hey, Bad Magic, I just wanted to write in about a user submission you had in last week's episode, namely Sarah in Texas. I don't know if you could pass the message to her, but I would like to extend my condolences and support her uh, as a, you know, her, her way. I didn't know the best way to go about this, though. I understand what it is like to lose a parent to suicide. My mom killed herself while I was in Marine boot camp in January of 2012. I tried counseling, but I ended up getting stuck inside my own head later, which ended with my separation from the military. Since then, I've been able to keep a job for around seven years, get married, and have more good days than bad. To Sarah, hey neighbor, this is Vince from New Mexico. You are not alone. Sometimes just changing your scenery can do wonders for you. It always helps to have a good support system too. Don't trust yourself on the bad days. Always try to get outside yourself and lean on the people who truly care about you. When you're feeling down, schedule something fun in the near future. It doesn't have to be much just easy enough to achieve. This will help you have some positive anticipation in your life. If you need someone outside your day-to-day to talk to, I can offer friendship and positive conversation. Thank you, Bad Magic, for everything you do. And a special thanks to uh, Jesse Kalai on Discord for instructing me on the right way to reach out. I didn't, I didn't care either way. If you read this on the show, or I don't care either way, uh, you can use whatever information you want on air, first name, last name, email address. Also, my Discord handle is Coop in a Cage, if that makes it easier. If you do read this on the show, anyone who may need someone to talk to, I'm all ears. I'm not a medical professional, but I can listen. Thank you, Vince. Well, thank you, Vince. Uh, I hope Sarah hits you up. Sarah Vince's email is Vincent, V-I-N-C-E-N-T, Navarrete, uh, it's actually dot Navarrete, so Vincent dot N A V A R R E T T E at gmail dot com. Vincent dot Navarrete at gmail dot com. Full name Vincent Navarrete. N A V A R R E T T E. An offer of friendship and positive conversations. Beautiful officer. Uh, beautiful offer. Jesus Christ, Vince. I can't talk. You know that. Uh, so glad to hear you're doing a lot better than you used to be. Uh, we have some wonderful meat sacks in this community of ours. We're very lucky. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, and now let's answer another update from Suck246, The Trail of Tears. Mystery Meat Sack, Mary finally writes back, uh, Hello, Reverend Suck Nasty and the esteemed members of the Bad Magic team. I was enjoying learning about the true history of the Trail of Tears and picture my own adventures on a swamp horse when I heard an update concerning a plea for romance. I am the lady hiker, aka girl of his dreams, that met Jonathan with the hiking group. While he is a wonderful human, I never called because we live in different states and have quite the age gap. Whatever consolation it may be, we are Facebook friends now. But man, am I glad I could convert uh, another time sucker slash space lizard. Please read this on air so that if we join another hike together, it is super awkward. Fuck you. Fuck your family. Keep on sucking. <laughs> oh, sorry. Shout this like a whipple at it. And fuck you. Fuck your family. Keep on sucking. Mary, please don't share my last name. I like the instructions, Mary. I do. Uh, Mary and Jonathan uh, are friends now. That's awesome. For, for Mary. 
Not sure Jonathan loves being in the friend zone, but I think, you know, better than no zone. I hope. Uh, hope you two do enjoy a hike together. Uh, c- keep an eye out for shrub sluts, male and female if you do, and for creeps like Yates hiding in the fucking bushes with their shirts off. Uh, thanks for updating us, Mary and Hale Lucifino. Uh, real quick update now to last week's suck on Dr. Death, Jack Kevorkian. Uh, from super sucker Thomas Chastain, who writes, you mentioned Steve Gleason on the latest podcast, but you didn't mention the amazing documentary he did. It's available on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Strongly recommended. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Others also wrote in about this. And the doc is called just simply Gleason. G-L-E-A-S-O-N. Has nearly 5,000 ratings on Amazon Prime, which is a lot for that platform. And a 4.8 out of 5 star rating, which is very, very good. Uh, The description reads, At the age of 34, Steve Gleason, former NFL defensive back and New Orleans hero, was diagnosed with ALS. Doctors gave him two to five years to live. So that is what Steve chose to do. Live. This film incorporates personal video journals from Gleason from his then or for his then unborn son to footage of his adventures undertaken as part of his mission to live his life to the fullest. So hail Nimrod. Uh, Thanks for getting me to uh, promote that documentary, Thomas. And one more now. Update to the New Mexico prison riot suck a few weeks back. Long time awesome sack Jackie B writes, Hello, suck master supreme lover of all things weird and king of peepee creepers. I just wanted to write in about my own experience with the American prison system in response to the recent suck on the New Mexico prison riot. I know I'm a bit late, but wanted to share anyways. I don't apologize for the long email. Buckle up and let's get into it. When I was only 14, my mom was arrested in front of me for heroin possession. That night, my mom, who was deep in her addiction, had taken me to the doctor for a physical uh, for a physical, and then to Dairy Queen. I accidentally spilled a drink, so we pulled over to gas station and we were cleaning up the mess when suddenly I heard, put your hands up and back up towards my voice. I turned behind me, saw a huge cop with a gun in my face. Look over to see my mom in the same situation. Someone my mom had scorned had seen us and called the cops saying we were distributing drugs from our car. This was the response. Guns in the face of two small women, myself being a 100-pound 14-year-old girl. My mom was arrested and what ensued afterwards was two and a half years of insanity. We found out my mom was pregnant while she was in prison and this gave her a little bit of an easier time for the first nine months. She was allowed to eat more than the others and was allowed more access to the infirmary but only at the discretion of whatever guard was there that day. So if the guard didn't think it was worth seeing a doctor, my mom was refused healthcare. This entire time, we were visiting my mom, waiting for her to be sentenced. She was facing 17 years for heroin, less than a gram of heroin. If that sentence had gone through, she would have gotten out when I was 31. Fast forward a bit, my mom goes into labor. She's taken to the hospital after about three hours of telling a grumpy guard that she really was in labor and not faking it. She was then handcuffed to a bed, not allowed privacy, The nurses and doctors spoke to the guards about what was going on instead of directly to my mom, often treating her like she was just an animal, giving birth and nothing more. When my little brother was born, my mom was not allowed to hold him for more than five minutes, was not allowed to be alone with him at all. She is a non-violent offender. She isn't even allowed to hold her own baby without some guard standing there. When we got there, we were told we were not allowed to see my mom at all and that we wouldn't get to hold the baby until we were uh, cleared to take him. My first time meeting my little brother was through a pane of glass. We finally got my little brother, took him home. We continued to visit my mom in the meantime. And I didn't mention this earlier, but you as the family of an inmate are treated like garbage. I was 14. I was told I wasn't allowed to bring in a drawing I'd made for my mom to show her through a pane of dirty plexiglass. At this point, I've not hugged my mom in over a year. I was only allowed to see her through the glass and that was it. When we started to bring my little brother, we were treated even worse. Being told we were endangering him by bringing him to a place like that. But what choice did we have? It wasn't the safest place for any of us. Oftentimes it was really scary, but there were no other options. One and a half years in, we go to visit my mom, find out she's been transferred. We were never even told she was even on the transferred list. Now she's gone and they couldn't tell us where she was going. A month later, we find out she's transferred four hours away. The only good thing that came from this was that after two months of her being there, we were finally allowed to visit and we got physical visits. This was the first time I'd hugged my mom in 20 months. First time she got to hold my brother since he was born. I can't describe what that felt like. My first thought when I hugged my mom uh, after so long was that I had forgotten how she smelled. I don't think I've ever cried so hard. Can you imagine not hugging your mom or not hugging your child for almost two years, not touching their hand or smelling their hair? When she was released two years later, she was given men's clothing and no undergarments to leave in, but she didn't care. She was finally free. We went, picked her up, something I wasn't sure I would get to do before I turned 20. I write all this to say that the system is bullshit. Even now, my mom and I get backlash from people who find out that she served time. Not only is the inmate treated badly, but so is their family. 
Like being related to someone who made a mistake makes you a piece of shit too. Thank you, Suckmaster, for covering the American prison system, not sugarcoating the absolute garbage that passes every day. Looking at the true facts is the only way to fix this. I appreciate you so, so much. You and Bad Magic have gotten me through my undergraduate degree, the beginning of my PhD program, lots of really hard times, uh, loss, and a list of other things I won't get into here. This community means the world to me, and I don't know where I'd be without it. Your loyal, time-sucking, creepy dummy, Jackie B. Jackie B! Uh, Sorry you had to go through all that bullshit. Uh, Man, what a bunch of uh, nonsense for a non-violent, drug-using offense. A drug that Big Pharma got most of the people fucking hooked on. Legally, right? Powerfully. And then the people who did that, yeah, they pay huge fines, but they're still rich. They're still fine. They're not in jail. Uh, I am convinced the drug laws in this country are absolute fucking bullshit passed by the country club uh, crowd to punish the poor and the marginalized, right? Laws passed by the entitled to punish those born with nothing but disadvantages in too many cases. Once again, fuck Nixon, fuck Reagan. How many people already struggling have been kicked when they're down by abusive sentencing laws for nonviolent offenders? The fucking self-righteous motherfuckers that pass this shit. Not condoning parental heroin addiction, but clearly your mom needed treatment more than incarceration. Hope her life has been full of light and opiate-free since her release. And fuck Purdue Pharma again, man. Those people should be fucking executed. Uh, Stay away from those opiates, meat sacks. Get treatment if you need it. Uh, And if you can't stop using, uh, you need it. You You need treatment. Don't end up in prison. Keep on studying, Jackie B. Keep getting smarter, Help change this uh, world for the good. Fight for, fight for, you know, what's right. Hail Nimrod and keep on sucking everyone. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meet Sex. Please don't hide behind your family to help get in way with uh, killing sex workers this week. Please just don't kill sex workers. Be, be nice to them. They're being very, very nice to you. Maybe instead, all of you can just keep on sucking. Add Magic Productions. Hey, Dan? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know I hate to bring this up, but... Yeah. You owe me 50 bucks. Oh, wow. I've been, I've been yeah, putting it off for yeah, a while, but the, like, I gotta, my right, kids are they're crying. Right. And oh my gosh, what? Is that a toucan? God damn it. Always, every time.